morning and welcome to the University of Sydney's 2021 Open Day and thanks for joining us here on the virtual quad for UCID TV. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which the University of Sydney stand, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Wawani, Inide, Tili, Niego, Gambanga, Tili, Niego, Wangan. I'd like to extend that acknowledgement to those First Nations people joining us today and those tuning in at home. My name is Tilly Langford and I'll be your host today. I'm in my third year of arts law here at the University of Sydney. I came in through the Gadigal program and I originally come from the south coast of New South Wales, Ulladulla. And with me today is my co-host, Rady Ma. Thanks Tilly. Hi everybody. My name is Rady Ma and I'm currently in my second year of a medical degree at the University of Sydney. I've previously studied Bachelor of Applied Science in Exercise and Sports Science. Now, the highlight of my year so far has been going into surgical theatres, seeing brain surgery, that is, of the head and the spine. I also like to get involved outside of the classroom at the university in the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Wrestling Club, as well as SUMSA, which is the Sydney University Muslim Student Association. Now, we understand that there are a few changes happening with the HSC and off arounds. So, if you have any questions, we have an FAQ on our admissions pathway website, or you can speak to our staff in the admission hub. So please don't worry, we'll advise students of any changes as they come. So for today, just enjoy exploring all your areas of interest and chat to our staff in the Course Advice Centre if you have any concerns. Thanks for that, Rady. In a moment, we will give you an overview of UCID TV and let you know how you can get involved and ask our guest questions. But first, let's start today with the Welcome to Sydney. <laughs> Hello, my name is Craig Madden. I'm a proud Bunjalung Gadigal man from the Eora Nation. I'm here at Sydney University on Gadigal land. Jinyura Gadigal, this land is Gadigal. It's customary for Aboriginal people to invite guests or visitors onto our land or country. It's a custom that we've been doing for thousands of years. I'd like to pay my respects to our elders, past, present and emerging. To any visitors from any other nations or countries, to all our non-Aboriginal brothers and sisters, a warm and sincere welcome to Gadigal land, Aboriginal land. The Gadigal clan is one of 29 clans which make up the Euro nation. It's a nation that's bound by three distinct landmarks. So we have the Horse River to the north, the Nepean River to the west, and the Georgia River to the south. Within the confines of those mighty rivers lie the Eora Nation, and the land of the Gadigal people that we stand on are one of the 29 clans of that nation. So on behalf of our Gadigal mob, I'd like to say, welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to the University of Sydney. I'm standing on Gadigal country, where the Gadai people have lived, have loved, and have educated and exchanged knowledge with others across this great nation of ours for tens of thousands of years. The University of Sydney's campuses and facilities are on the ancestral lands of peoples who have loved and known and nourished this land since the very beginning of time. For thousands of generations, they've shared knowledge, they've exchanged learning, and understood how it is to be here in this wonderful place that today we call Australia. If you have a look around the campus, you'll see some remarkable places. Some of those places are buildings like our quadrangle, but that quadrangle tells a different story. Many people look at it and see it as the height of European endeavour. Well, that quadrangle, that building that hosts the Great Hall was built out of sandstone that was quarried on Gadigal and Wongal country with timber felled from Bundjalung country to the north and mortar that was made from lime and shells that was found on site at this place. Our place is full of stories woven together and revealing the many, many, many histories of Australia's first peoples. All of our facilities sit on the ancestral lands of Aboriginal people. There is not a part of Australia that is not known, loved and nourished by Aboriginal people of this land since time began. The university stands on Durrick land in Camden, Wongal country in Lidcombe, Gamilaroi country in Narrabri, Wiradjuri country in Dubbo, 
and all the way to Bundjalung country in Lismore and Gagadu country in Gakadu. Our staff, students, alumni continue the tradition of teaching and learning upon these lands proudly. As a community, we come together as one Sydney, but many peoples. Nyunyanda, Maganiana, Yama, Jingiwala, Yarpalinganya, Yarama, Yarama Gimbe. Welcome, welcome to the University of Sydney. Welcome back and thanks for joining us, everybody. Now we're gonna take a moment to go over what's happening at Open Day and on UCTV. So today there are three key features to Open Day. The first one is our lecture program, which will be covering all areas of the university. The second one is our course advice center, where you can talk to our staff and students. And the third is right here on UCTV, where the highlight of our program will be having live interviews with our current students. So you can learn all about the student experience. Now I'll throw you to Tilly, who's going to explain how you can get involved with us on UCTV. Thanks, Riley. We're going to be interviewing current students from around the university. If you have questions you'd like to ask, you can go to the Slido located below the UCTV stream on the Open Day website, or you can head to slido.com and enter the code hashtag UCTV to join the Q&A. So that is capital U, capital S, and then lowercase YDTV. Soon we'll be back with a live interview with Ben, one of our current students from the School of Education. If you have a question for Ben, please submit it to Slido. But before that, we're going to have a quick campus tour, hear from UAC about what uni can offer you, and hear from some of our students about their favourite university experiences. Hi, I'm Emily, and today I'm going to show you around the University of Sydney. There's a lot of history here at the uni, and you can't help but feel part of something bigger when you step on campus. One of the things that I really like about the university is the sense of community that exists here, and I think it's the grounds and the space that really allows that. Students used to play tennis in the middle of the quad right here. Today, this space and the surrounding lawns are a place for teaching, events, lots of great photo opportunities, and of course, hanging out with friends. You can see why this whole place is known as the Oxford of the Southern Hemisphere. And this is the Great Hall, the first and last stop for a lot of students, where we have graduations and welcome new students from overseas. If you look up, you'll see 12 carved wooden angels, they're carrying books and scrolls inscribed with symbols referring to the arts and sciences. There's a lot more history here, like this. This is the Anderson Stewart Building, formerly known as the Old Medical School. This building is home to the university's first human dissection labs. Since then, our network of clinical schools has grown to include 10 major metropolitan and rural teaching hospitals. And it's not just health and medicine with campuses all around. About 70 kilometres that way, you'll find our Camden Farms. Aside from agriculture and vet students getting hands-on with plants, crops and animals, you'll see plenty of wildlife with regular visits from the locals. The uni has 18 farms in New South Wales, spanning over 12,000 hectares. The university's Westmead campus will open its new education and clinical facilities in 2021. In all these places, health students will get to be in real life clinical settings from their first year. And then there's this. This is the Susan Wakel building. It brings together all the health disciplines under the one roof. Inside, there are brand new simulation facilities, a multi-service clinic and a rehabilitation gym, as well as teaching, research and support spaces. Speaking of gym spaces, there's no end of sports facilities at the uni. There's the Sports and Aquatic Centre, an indoor climbing centre, tennis courts and squash courts. Any type of sport goes on here, including of course, Quidditch. <laughs> the university's facilities are one of the best things about studying here, especially places like this, the Abercrombie Building, one of my favourite study spots and home to our business school. The views of Sydney at the top are also pretty cool. 
I find my experience studying at UCF very engaging and rewarding. I get to meet people from all over the world and make friends with them. For myself, learning on campus really motivates me to find the areas I'm truly passionate about. Here's Sydney College of the Arts, brand new facilities. It has traditional fine arts and crafts, film and digital labs. You can create almost anything here, both physical and virtual. Then there's the new multi-purpose social sciences building. Near the social sciences building is Courtyard Cafe. It's a great place to have a drink and catch up with some friends. There's no end to great cafes and shops around campus. And you get to Courtyard Cafe via the legendary graffiti tunnel and a place for creative expression. You can spray paint, write slogans and create street art. It's a use of students' rite of passage. Just here, researchers and students are deepening their knowledge of the tiniest things in the universe at the Nanoscience Hub. And this is the Quantum Lab, the clean room, where every 68 seconds, all the air is replaced completely. Not a single stray hair is allowed inside. This is Fisher Library. With around 5.2 million items, the University of Sydney has the largest academic library in the Southern Hemisphere. The library has an incredible range of rare books hidden down here, and I've always loved checking them out. Some of them are over 500 years old. And then there's the facilities for our law students. How's this for a study spot? Or the moot courtroom to prepare for the real deal. But you're probably not coming to uni just to see the books, but to actually do things, make things, experiment. The university has heaps of facilities, workshops and labs for any discipline. Just inside here is one of Australia's best equipped fabrication and prototyping labs. The Design Modelling and Fabrication Lab, we say DMAF around here, includes a wide range of robotic arms, 3D printers, laser cutters and basically a whole lot of cool stuff, but I better leave it to the experts to use it. You'll get in the field experience and interact with new and diverse environments, all without leaving campus. I love that there are so many cool things that I can use in order to explore my creative side and create these amazing works of art. Speaking of art, this is the Chow Chak Wing Museum. It houses the university's collection of incredible artworks, natural history specimens, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural materials, and ancient artifacts, including mummies. For lots of students, the museum is their classroom. Courses across all disciplines explore exhibitions here and examine precious objects in the dedicated study rooms. Just a few minutes walk along City Road and you'll find the newly built Life, Earth and Environmental Sciences building, home to some of the many science labs we have on campus. Our immersive learning lab is the largest of its kind in Australia. There are several new precincts that are opening soon. This engineering precinct is opening in 2021. It may not be finished just yet, but trust me, it's going to look like this. I think the best thing about studying engineering at USAID is definitely the fact that you're learning under one of the best faculties in the world and using top-of-the-line infrastructure every day. This is the Conservatorium of Music and here you will truly experience the music industry in action. It's home to five performance venues like this, the Verbruggen Hall, sound mixing studios and not to mention some world-class talent. And it's also located right next to the Sydney Botanical Gardens and Sydney Opera House. Pretty incredible. One of my favourite things about living and studying in Sydney is being able to be so close to the city, but also a bus ride away from the beach. If you want a break from your studies, you can always go to the beach with your friends and have a chill time. That's what's great about the main campus. It's only a 10 minute bus ride from the centre of Sydney. It's only a 20 minute walk from Central Station to the University as well, so you're pretty much at the centre of everything here. I like to mix it up. Sometimes I get the bus and the train, sometimes I get the ferry if it's a nice day, or I drive. You want to make sure your time at uni is one to remember, and that can start with where you live. There are two main kinds of accommodation on the Camperdown Darlington campus. 
university residences like this one, the Queen Mary Building, or residential colleges. Rich in history and tradition, every college offers a living experience that will let you study and enjoy a busy social calendar. They offer three catered meals a day, laundry services and a strong support network. I think living on campus has really helped me grow as an individual and have a community, a home away from home. So I'm really grateful for the convenience, the community and the confidence I have in the staff to help me through my journey. And your university experience won't be anything without all the incredible opportunities to make friends. There are so many clubs and societies that you can get involved with on campus. I personally, as a media student, have loved getting involved with things like reporting for the student newspaper on Isoir, doing student radio at Surge, and getting involved with the Media and Communications Society. That just scratches the surface of why the University of Sydney is such a great place to pursue your studies and follow your interests. I hope we'll see you on campus soon. So thinking about uni can be really exciting, especially if you're deciding between two different offers or if you're choosing a course to study at a university or if you're deciding between two different institutions. But it's really important to remember that university is more than just the course that you'll be studying and you're going to be spending at least three years of your life at this place. So these are the sort of things that you should be thinking about before you commit. So some of those questions might be accommodation. Will you be living on campus? What are the residences like? Are the buildings new? Is it private accommodation? Is it shared? Are meals included? There's lots of things that you probably wouldn't be thinking about at this stage, but they will have an impact on you later. If you want to have a very social experience at university, you should be thinking about the clubs and societies, what sort of clubs and societies will be at your university, how do people socialise, are there places to hang out, the facilities offered at your university are very important, especially if you're studying a degree that relies on resources. If you were to study a digital media or a visual arts course, do they offer a studio space or an editing lab? Because those sort of things will definitely make your studying experience more enjoyable. It's important to think about what sort of facilities are offered at your campus. Are there cafes? Is there a gym? In the future, if you wish to study abroad, you need to think about if your university offers that. Will your chosen course be available to do via exchange? You know, if you're studying a course that doesn't allow for exchange, you really need to think about if that's something you want to commit to. And if you are going on exchange, you want to make sure that you're able to get that time credited towards your degree. And if you have a certain destination country in mind, you want to make sure that your university offers that in their study abroad program as well. And this one might seem really silly, but if you're thinking about driving to campus, where will you be parking your car? Is there parking available to students? How much is it going to cost you? Can you get a student parking permit? You know, is there close links to public transport? These are all the sorts of questions that you should be asking before you commit to a place at a university. Although they all seem like little things, they can all add up to you either enjoying or not enjoying your university experience. My name is Alex and I'm in my sixth year now of a biomedical engineering and commerce degree here at the university. Hi, my name is Daniel and I'm currently studying a third year Bachelor of Commerce and Advanced Studies in University of Sydney. Hi, my name is Christina Soji, but most people call me Chris. I am in my fourth year of study here at the University of Sydney and I am doing a Bachelor of Music. My name is Nate. I am in my fourth year of an arts and law degree, currently doing an honours year, which is the Bachelor of Advanced Studies Honours in Philosophy. My name is Carla. I'm in my fifth year of university and I am currently studying a Masters of Nursing graduate entry program. Previously, I completed the Bachelor of Science and I majored in Anatomy and Histology while doing that degree. I chose my degree because I enjoyed the humanities in school, so I really enjoyed English, I enjoyed writing my Extension 2 piece, um, and I also loved sort of thinking about the reasons behind what I was learning in class. So philosophy seemed like a natural choice. 
Um, I chose law because I enjoyed debating in school. Um, and generally, I, I like the sort of employability that a law degree does provide you. Um, and, and, and I had heard from previous students that the critical thinking skills that you get from a law degree um, set you up well wherever you want to go. My decision to study business was guided by my intrinsic ambition to help and impact infinite amount of people within a finite amount of time given to me. I originally started in the biomedical engineering degree because it combined my genuine interest in the human body and wanting to help people, but with also this desire to look into things like technology and innovation. I later picked up the commerce side of my degree four years into my uni experience after completing one of the internships. For me, music has always been my passion uh, and my goal, and I just love studying music. What is the shared pool and have you accessed it in your studies? Do you plan to access it? Shared pool refers to commonly shared majors, minors, interests across nine key faculties in Sydney University. It really allows students to pursue their own interests. I was able to major in anatomy and histology while also minoring in languages and I was able to learn my third language here at the University of Sydney. On top of that, I was also able to do a lot of, you know, units of studies in ethics, philosophy. I was also doing it in like zoology as well. So it's really awesome. And the way we were able to do that is by our shared pool of majors and minors. So have you completed a real world project, internship or placement? So yes, I've done a few of these. The first I'll mention is on my engineering side, where I was lucky enough to complete the Engineering Sydney Industry Placement Scholarship. This is where engineering students spend six months working full time, getting paid at a company, and mine was at Cochlear, which is well renowned for their ear implant solutions. Here I was writing my engineering thesis, which is essentially an individual student-led piece of research. I was lucky enough to be optimizing the design of one of the surgical tools as part of one of the mechanical research and development teams at Cochlear. Not only did this account for six months of my full-time study load at the university, but now the design of my um, surgical tool will be used in the worldwide rollout of the new cochlear implant. Are you in any clubs or societies or teams? So I am part of the UC Writing Society and I have been on the executive for a couple of years now. I came to uni, I didn't want to study creative writing, but I wanted to keep that up as a hobby. So the club was a great way for me to balance that interest with my studies and meet other like-minded people. Um, I've also been on the executive of the Duke of Ed Society. So that's expeditions all around Sydney, bushwalking, that sort of stuff. Um, as well as a couple of uh, society events that I got along to just for fun, um, like the Chocolate Society, which is which is pretty cool. Um, professional development societies are pretty good and they're very well embedded with um, your faculty. So through the Sydney University Law Society, um, I've gotten involved in a lot of networking events with future employers, as well as just sort of general tips and tricks on how to do well in your home faculty. What has been your best memory or experience so far here at the university? Well, essentially, because of this university, I was able to make so many new friends and learn so many new opportunities as well. Because I had such different interests and hobbies in my undergraduate degree, I was doing a, you know, a medicine and health major. But on top of that, I was also pursuing, you know, arts majors and minors and doing so many different subjects. I was able to make so many new friends in all of those different areas of studies, which was so cool because I was able to get that different perception I think some of the best memories I have from my university experience is honestly the friends that you make and all the social things that come from being on campus and as well I lived on campus for three years. I'm so grateful for everyone that I've met during my university experience and I really couldn't pinpoint a single moment that has made it what it has been. Do you have any tips for students? Oh my gosh, plan your semester, please. Um, have a look at what you're doing and set out a course map for yourself. Think about what you have to do for each subject every week. Sometimes when you're doing three to five subjects, it can get a little bit confusing. Um, but as long as you stay on top of your work and you plan ahead a little bit, it's, it's easier. Also, have fun. Don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Sign up to that random club. Sign up um, to a production. Uh, put yourself out of your comfort zone because these are the years of your life where you will develop into the person you're supposed to be. It's totally normal to not know what you want to do in your future. So don't be too stressed. But stay curious, stay open-minded. Along the way, you're going to find out so many different things about yourself and where your interests truly lie. 
So do not be afraid to change once you start. Join as many clubs as you, as you can. Um, I joined a whole ton. I didn't go to all the events, but it allowed me to get a taste of um, all these different um, areas of interest. Um, and from that, I got to sort of narrow down my experience and figure out what I was really interested in. The world is your oyster. Don't ever feel like you have to stick to one pathway because let me tell you, you are probably going to change your mind a couple of times down the road. And guess what? That's completely fine. So best of luck and good luck with all your studies. Welcome back, everybody. Now I have the pleasure of welcoming our very first guest for the day. Welcome, Ben. Now you study within the School of Education and Social Work. So to start off, can you tell us a little bit about your degree? Yeah, sure. So I just want to say, first of all, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben. I currently study a Bachelor of Science along with a Bachelor of Secondary Education, where I'm currently majoring in mathematics and modern history. It's quite an interesting combination, don't get me wrong, but the fact that I'm able to do both mathematics and modern history at the same time while at university is pretty cool. Awesome. So I wanted to ask, why did you choose to study education then? Education. Oh, well, that's a pretty big question. Um, well, for me personally, I always enjoyed the dynamic nature of teaching in a classroom. You're always educating new groups of students um, throughout the year and even in years forward. But also I want to add is that you also get the benefit of getting, becoming more familiar with the subject that you're teaching. You're not teaching brand new things every single year. You get each successive year to hone your craft, to get better at it, whilst also interacting with new groups of students each time. So it keeps things fresh. Awesome, definitely a very rewarding career. Now, is the degree what you expected when you started versus now? And why, why not? Definitely, um, or if there were a few surprises in there, uh, especially with the teachers who were extremely supportive in the way they helped us uh, integrate into university was also um, becoming more familiar with the teaching process as well. I kind of thought I'd be left out in the deep end that just chuck us into the, um, the end of the water and be like, be free, swim child. But no, they actually helped us along the way and really gave a hand when they needed to. So um, that's really great to hear, Ben. So we're going to go to some questions from the audience. And my first one is, how are students collaborating during the lockdown? Look, I'll be honest, um, it's much more difficult to collaborate for assignments or even just interacting with students in general during a lockdown. But the opportunity is still there. In classes, you still get teachers who assign breakout rooms to students where you get to interact with a small group of your peers. And during those breakout rooms, you can actually, you know, con ask them to contact you uh, and collaborate with assignments. I mean, for sure, for me personally, I've asked and reached out to a lot of people. and They've been more than happy to provide their contact details so that we can collaborate on assignments and read each other's reflections to give feedback. It was really cool. Awesome. That's really great to hear, Ben. And another question that um, is being very quickly, very quickly upvoted is, do you get to do practical experiences and where did you complete it? Ah, uh, practical experiences. Um, well, throughout university, there's an expectation that you get to work in the classroom. You get to practice being a teacher. It's kind of where you get to mess up a little bit before getting thrown out into the real world with a bit of supervision provided from your teachers as well. So for me, at least, uh, practical start in my third year. Because it is a five-year degree, we do start on the ladder in the ladder end. So in the third year, we only get about four weeks worth of prac, followed in our fourth year with five weeks. And finally, in our sixth year, in our fifth year, sorry, we get seven weeks. So there is quite a lot involved um, for our practicals. You do get the experience of starting slowly. Again, they don't toss you into the deep end. They, you start easy. You only start by observing. And gradually over the years, you build up on more responsibilities until your final prac, where you're actually given about 80% of the teaching workload. I want to stress as well that it's actually different for social work. Um, people who do a thousand hours in their last two years in the third and fourth year with primary education as well, because you, you have a four year degree, you actually start your practicals in your second year. So there are differences involved, but all in all, each and every single education and social work degree, you get the benefit of having experience 
in the field. You're out there teaching class, teaching in a classroom and applying theory into practice. Lovely to hear, Ben, that hands-on experience is really valuable. Um, so another question that's being very quickly upvoted now is what are some of your favorite university experiences? What are some of my favorite university experiences? Oh man, um, this is just a personal one for me, but it was definitely learning latex in the space of my mid mid semester break. Um, up until that point, I was trying to figure out how I should write notes for a mathematics subject. And then all of a sudden it hit me. I was like, hey, why don't I try learn all of latex in the space of a week in preparation for the exam? And so I did. It was very stressful, don't get me wrong. And the learning curve for latex was painful, um, but it was a very rewarding experience. And I'm thankful that the university was able to at least push me academically and really try to hone my skills, my critical thinking skills, but also my adaptability. Um, don't get me wrong, it was pretty stressful, uh, but all at the end of the day, it was still a very rewarding experience. Awesome, fantastic to hear, Ben. Now, a really good question, which just come through, what skills and qualities do you need to be a teacher? Skills and qualities. Well, the first one and the most important one is a love of, of your students, a love of children. Um, it's about really going out there and understanding who the student is and what they're trying to get out of education. Because even though all students are different, you know, we're all, we're all our own individuals, at the end of the day, it's about having a passion for each and every single one of them. It's about guiding them along their educational journey. Um, but the, you know, there's also important skills such as being able to socialize, being able to communicate a point succinctly and with clarity. But for me, at least, the most important part and skill of being a teacher is having a passion and care for each and every single one of your students. Well, thank you so much for your time, Ben. It really has been a pleasure having you on UCTV TV today. Um, so we'll be back with a live interview with one of our law students. If you have any questions, don't forget to submit them using Slido. But before then, let's take a quick tour of the Sydney Law School and learn a bit about the Summer Innovation Program. Hi, my name is Nate. I'm in my fourth year of an Arts and Law degree at the University of Sydney. One of the great things about studying at the University of Sydney is our beautiful campus. The Law Building is located on Eastern Avenue in the heart of Main Campus. We are Australia's oldest university and the architect who designed the Law Building wanted to embody harmony between the old and the new. The modern glass structure reflects the traditional sandstone of the Anderson Stewart Building just opposite. The school has also been designed to recognise the owners of the land on which the campus stands, the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. At the entrance to the building, you'll find the native Gaddi trees, which once defined Sydney's landscape. You'll also find the stunning indigenous garden a little further inside. But before you head inside, there's a rather unusual metal structure on the right of the entrance. Now this is actually a skylight that provides natural light to the law library, which is located underground. If you're interested in law, a big part of your experience, and it's definitely a big part of mine, is studying and reading. So we have the law library, plus lots of purpose-built spaces for individual and group study. But it's not just about reading, you need to put the theory into practice. The Moot Court is one of those places where you can do that, where you simulate what it's like to prepare and deliver a case in court. We compete in programs like the Jessup Cup, where law students from around the world battle it out in an international mooting competition. The Cup has been running since 1960, and Sydney Law School holds the world record for the most victories, including in 2021, so we're also the current champions. Well, that's all I have time to show you today. I hope you've enjoyed the sneak peek of the Sydney Law Building, and I hope to see you on campus soon. excited by the material that SIP was able to do and I thought it was really incredible that they were able to build a model and to do something exciting. I applied for SIP because it was something related to innovation and business and developing an idea from the start to have it flourish. Just the idea of working with so many different students from different backgrounds, different levels of degrees. It provided such immense opportunity to explore some of my deeper passions. 
It's an absolute whirlwind. You learn a huge amount in five weeks. It's a real crash course in innovation. Working in a team of diverse academic backgrounds meant I had exposure to disciplines that I never imagined that I would interact with. One of the highlights of working with students from different academic backgrounds is definitely the different lenses that they lend to interpreting the problem as well as the solutions that we have. Speaking to industry mentors, getting their feedback and sort of engaging with a variety of people from different academic backgrounds, uh, industry, businesses, and sort of being able to build that connection as well as work in a supportive team environment. Interdisciplinarity is completely the way of the future in terms of solving complex challenges. It's absolutely crucial to not only solve problems but to think differently and to innovate. We think that innovation is something that's obviously critical. Participation in something like this means that we can also maintain a dialogue within the firm with our clients and hopefully with the student body about the importance of innovation. I still think that at the university we are not working enough at the level of team work so this is a great anticipation for them of how it's going to be to manage different personalities, different ways of working, and just coming together to produce something. I never thought that creativity could be taught or learned, but this process has definitely helped me become a more creative thinker. I've learned a lot through the Summer Innovation Program, but I think the biggest one that I've learned is that technology and gaps in technology are everywhere, and it takes creativity and being able to spot those gaps. Ideas are more easy to kind of translate into reality than people think. I was amazed at how at every turn we would sort of present something and we were like, oh, can we actually do that? And they, everyone we spoke to in the industry or academics was like, yes, you can definitely do that. I think one of the highlights of living and learning on campus is just a collegiate spirit. So there was a great opportunity for us to really work with one another, get to know each other, eat with each other, have ice cream with each other, exchange ideas within a college setting. It's truly a very remarkable experience. The biggest takeaway I have from SIP is the amazing academic resources that are available to individuals as long as they apply and try. Definitely apply if you're interested in innovation and bring big ideas and presenting big ideas. It's an incredible opportunity to be able to work with industry, uh, academics, incredible mentors. The energy, the knowledge, the expertise that's being shared around, it's just a once in a lifetime opportunity. Don't hesitate, go apply, something special might happen. These are skills they would not learn anywhere else and we truly stand for the values of interdisciplinarity, passion and innovation that we convey in this program. Hello everyone, welcome back to the virtual quad. I have me, I have with me here Adam Herman, who is one of my fellow law students. So first to kick off, hello Adam, can you tell us a little bit about your degree? Absolutely, thanks Tilly. Um, hi everyone, my name is Adam. I'm a fifth and final year student here at UCID. I'm studying a Bachelor of Arts, majoring in Media Studies and a Bachelor of Law. Um, to me, you know, one of the things that a lot of students tend to ask and is a question that I even had when I was coming into university was how does it actually work? Am I sitting studying one degree the whole time and then am I studying the other degree the entire time afterwards? The answer is no, you actually study both of them at the same time. And for me, when I was studying arts, that was a great way for me to be studying um, two things concurrently, a great way to break up the year and a great way to learn things um, at the same time and get a little bit of variety in my degree. Yeah, incredible. I definitely didn't realise how much variety I would be able to have in my degree, even though I'm studying politics. I got to do creative writing for a little while. That was pretty fun. Um, so one of our top voted questions is what is the law community like at UCID? 
Yeah, for me, the law community is probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest highlight of coming to law school. Um, the, the, couple of, the last couple of videos you've seen um, just demonstrates that, I think, and, and this idea of collegiality. It's this idea of collaboration, um, no boundaries, um, teamwork. Those are really the key themes that I like to describe the law school. Um, a lot of those people in that video, Tilly and I um, are quite close friends with. Um, I mean, that's just an example of what it's like to come here. For instance, I've had times when I'm struggling um, on a particular concept and I'm clearly not getting it in the library, for instance. Um, and I'll just be able to get up, tap on someone's shoulder and ask them to run me through it. Um, that's the sort of teamwork and collegiate atmosphere you can expect here at UCID. Absolutely. So you've spoken about those friendships and things like that. But one of our other questions coming in is, do you have enough time to commit to other things aside from law, studies and school in general? Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the, the short answer to that is absolutely. Um, I couldn't imagine. Um, only studying for the full five years. And I think that would be sort of an unrealistic expectation to have anyway. Um, for me, the highlight of my degree has been being able to combine my degree, not only with studying, and that's obviously important, but just as important is that real world experience. So I work part-time alongside my degree. I'm fortunate enough to have a part-time job um, in a really fun company working in the law as well. So that's been great. Um, and by far and away, the majority of students here at UCID do the exact same thing. It's almost the norm, not the exception. Um, and so a lot of students um, devote their time not only just to their studies, but also to extracurricular activities, to clubs and societies, to part-time work. There's definitely an opportunity for you to get, sat get outside of the classroom. Totally. I know myself, I only spend about two days a week actually in a class. So that means there's plenty of time to get to do all the other things I want to. So leading on from that, can you get practical experience for law or for your other interests while still at uni? Definitely. There's probably two sides to this coin. The first, of, the first side is, you know, opportunities arranged through the university. I've been fortunate enough to have had three of these opportunities um, where we work essentially as, as consultants, as um, quasi employees um, for an organization, for an industry partner that, we've have, uh, that we have here at the uni. Um, the first of which um, I did overseas, which was an incredible experience. I worked for HSBC over in London. Um, and the good thing about that was that it, it was really interdisciplinary. So um, there was myself in a team, um, so I was a future lawyer, there was a future doctor, a future engineer, um, and we all worked collaboratively to work for HSBC over in London. Um, I just came off the back of another experience where we worked with Adobe. That one was fully remote, um, obviously, these COVID times, which was equally as exciting because it gave me a, an insight into um, the real world and, and to see how organisations get stuff done. Yeah, that sounds absolutely incredible. Um, so with that, you've talked about the connections that UCID has given you. What makes studying law at UCID different from studying law at other universities, do you think? Yeah, I think, I think for me, the, the key highlight has been, obviously, you know, strengths in academia is one thing. And we all know that the University of Sydney is far and away a leader in that, um, in that regard. So that's really important. That's probably number one. Number two um, is definitely the people. Um, I've already spoken about the collegiate atmosphere about the students, um, but that equally extends to the academics. You know, you're going to be spending a lot of time in the classroom. Um, let's not, um, you know, talk down how hard and how challenging this degree can be. Um, but for me, it's been really good to have academics who genuinely care about your performance, who genuinely care about how they can push you further if you do have that capacity. They genuinely care about your, your real world outcomes. Um, and, you know, the support is there, um, but also the interest um, and the real support mechanisms personally on a on a face to face level um, with your academics, with your tutors. They're there to help you um, when even when you are struggling, but even when you're when you're excelling, they're there to push you even further. Absolutely. I've definitely experienced that as well myself. So with about two minutes to go, I have a couple more questions. What advice would you give to someone considering law? Ooh. I would say cast your net wide. I would definitely say cast your net wide because, you know, it can be very easy to pigeonhole yourself um, as I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do that and then I'm going to do that. Um, that might work for some people and if it does work for you, then power to you. 
but for me, I am so glad that I came into law school without that mindset because, you know, when you're at law school, there's just so many doors for you to open. Um, the good thing is, you know, you have so many resources at your fingertips. Um, you can make the most of it. And for me, those doors have just led me to fantastic places, which I never would have, you know, predicted um, back in first year. Um, so when you come here, definitely have an open mindset and just see how you go. Fantastic. Okay, the final question, just to wrap things up. I know that a lot of people feel like law is so tough because of the competitive nature, but I've had quite a different experience. I was just wondering what your experience was with how competitive is the law environment? Yeah, no, I... You know, I query whether, you know, where people are getting that vibe from, because I certainly, Tilly, agree with you. I have had a very different experience. I've never felt like it's cutthroat or anything like that. It's definitely not what it looks like in the movies or TV shows. Um, it's a fantastic collegiate experience and never once have I thought it's been overly competitive. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time, Adam. Um, it was an absolute pleasure having you on. In our next interview, Radi will be talking with two students from our science faculty. So if you would like to submit a question, remember to use the Slido. In the meantime, we're going to take a look at what studying food and agribusiness at UCIT is like and learn about the Bachelor of Liberal Arts and Sciences and take a tour of our science facilities. Agribusiness is about getting food from paddock to plate. It's about the logistics of moving food from the paddock, manufacturing, transport, food processing and meeting consumer needs. Companies in the food industry are very keen to employ graduates from this program because they have skills in both food science and in business. I've always had an interest in food science, but I also had an interest in business and marketing and I thought the course combined the two well. There is a very high demand for graduates in the industry and that was really important to me. Since starting the degree I've formed an interest in sustainable practices and informing consumers about where their food comes from and how they eat. I really like the practical side of the degree, so both the hands-on lab experience where we encounter um, real life problems with food and I also really like the site visits where we get to see real life the procedures that we've learned about in theory. Having small class sizes for our degree really helps to create a more relaxed learning environment. Because the size of a class, you can really, uh, really learn a lot from your professors, demonstrators, they are really helpful. I think one of the capstone experiences of our degree is the industry internship. It's a three month um, work placement that takes place during the third year of the degree. I'm really excited about the internship. I'm hoping to be placed in a company that will allow me to explore food science research or new product development as part of food technology. Food security is not only about access to food, it's about access to nutritious and healthy food that people like to eat. There are huge opportunities right on our doorstep in Asia, for example, to supply safe, affordable food. Since I grew up in China, it's an emerging um, food security problem and also a food safety problem. So I really do want to solve those problems. So that's why I came here and chose the degree. When I graduate, I hope to work in food product development where I can create an impact in the industry. I'm not really sure what I want to do when I graduate, but I definitely know that I'll go into something food science related or food technology related. We've got a huge problem of overnutrition and a problem of undernutrition right around the globe and the food and agribusiness degree can help focus on solving some of those problems. I think I'm starting with the first question. Why did you decide to study liberal arts and science? Uh, well, basically curiosity. Um, liberal arts and science is the best degree for curiosity because you get to basically major in a arts or human arts or science and then minor in an arts or science and then minor in liberal arts too. So you go really broad. I mean, it's really interesting. You get to learn lots of soft skills like writing and communication and stuff like that. So it's really broad and, and fulfills your curiosity. 
Who should study liberal arts and science? Everyone. Everyone should study it because it's such a broad generalist degree and particularly for all-rounders, I think, you know, people who either have passions in arts and science rather than one or the other. I think it's, it's one of those degrees that allow you to fulfil all of those needs. Yeah, and I think the degree is designed in a way that if you haven't studied for a while, we help you catch up with uh, any of those writing, communication, critical thinking um, skills yeah. uh, in the first year as well. And I think when we designed it in 2009, it was the only degree at Sydney University that offered those skills separate to your major and your, your sequence. So that means you could think critically, you could write critically, independent of what your major was, and then you could use those skills in writing your major. And that's complete, unique Sydney University experience. There is no other BLAS degree at any other university. Okay, next question. Um, why did you choose the University of Sydney? Um, there's a few reasons. Uh, I'm a sucker for architecture, so the beautiful buildings here were actually a big pull on me. I love the quad, I love all the old sandstone buildings, they're really beautiful and it's nice to be a part of that. But also, in the mix of that, there's all modern facilities, so there's really nice new computer rooms, huge libraries. Um, it's got, it's one of the best ranked in the, in Australia, if not the best ranked for most subjects, so it's, um, really good on intellectual stuff as well. And good social side, centrally located, it's it's perfect for me. I'm from literary studies and it's one of the highest ranked schools in Australia for literary studies. And, and yeah. psychology, I'm from psychology and it's got one of the highest ranked schools there as well. Yeah, uh, you're up next. Um, can you major, what are the options? Wow, I think there are currently 40 arts majors and about 30 science majors or more than that. I, I, it's just so broad. Uh, and I think that requires guidance. And I provide science major guidance and Ben provides arts major guidance for students who aren't quite sure. And it also gives the way it's designed the option for you to change your major. You might have thought you were a science major and, and, and started some science subjects and then realised you really loved arts. And it, there's room for you to switch, I think, mm. during the degree, which is also a good thing. Yeah, you, you must major yes. <laughs> in either science or arts. Um, and sometimes students can move from one to the other if they try one out and decide to, to do something else. That's right. um, in arts, it can be anything like... Uh, art history, um, theatre and performance studies, any languages um, are also in the arts. And in science, you've got anything from anatomy to psychology to biology. Yeah, absolutely. And like Ben said, it's either a, a science major and an arts sequence or an arts major and a science sequence. And there's opportunity for change midway through in case you want to switch. I think that's really good. What career opportunities are there? Take it away, Ben. <laughs> well, good news, Mitch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're about to graduate and there are lots of career opportunities. Um, I tell the story of a student we had a few years ago who majored in anatomy and histology and did a sequence in arts in writing and communication and digital cultures. And for her, that meant when she went out and applied for jobs in science labs, uh, she could also point to something on her degree uh, that, that showed her communication skills and her ability to talk about really complex science um, issues to non-specialist audiences. And that actually got her across the line for the job. So she found herself working in a really exciting lab, producing new knowledge and doing mm. new and interesting things. And she got to the opportunity to talk about that um, outside of that uh, specialist environment as well. Yeah, so it's like the liberal studies skill set that we have built into the degree help with the communication of the content they've learned <coughs> in their major. So the major probably drives your career opportunities in BLAS or in any generalist degree, but those liberal studies units and the sequence units kind of work together to give you the written and oral communication skills you need to be employable, uh, irrespective of what your major is. Yeah, that's one thing that, I, that I've really thought about too, is that the kind of soft skills that you learn in BLAS, like be, being a good writer, um, being a good communicator, being a good reasoner, all those skills are employable across every kind of industry, which is going to be even more important as things become increasingly automized. So those skills aren't going to become automized. You're always going to need them. 
and that gives you opportunities to go anywhere, no matter where the industries go. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point, Mitch. When we developed this degree in 2009, and the unique elements were the liberal studies components because employers came to us and said, we want graduates who can write, who can talk, who can critically think, who can reason, as well as the content area. And there wasn't a degree that really had that. And so BLAS really fills that gap, that unique mm. gap of the University of Sydney experience. Yeah. I've also heard from students who move into, say, the Masters of Teaching or a Masters of Pharmacy um, to specialise further um, into a career or in their um, chosen major. Yep. And they find that those skills set them up really well for postgraduate study yeah. as well. And related to that, there were some psychology majors in BLAS who got into honours and now they're doing postgraduate work in honours. Mm -hmm. So it can be the stepping stone to postgraduate work as well. And that's a career. We mm -hmm. can't just think it's about employability out there. It can also be postgraduate studies. That's the aim for me. <laughs> Is it? What are you thinking you're doing? Uh, I want to be an academic. Oh. Teach philosophy. <laughs> can't go wrong. Yeah, exactly. Hi, my name is Thomas and I'm a graduate from the Faculty of Science here at the University of Sydney and a current medical student. I chose to study a science degree here because of our innovative learning spaces, world-class professors and the interdisciplinary learning approach. I am joining you from my home on Gadigal Country and today I will be showing you around some of our fantastic facilities we have here at the University of Sydney. First up is the brand new Life, Earth and Environmental Sciences building home to some of the many science labs we have on campus. Our immersive learning lab is the largest of its kind in Australia. It uses the latest VR technology for teaching and experimentation. We also have a range of lab spaces for those of you interested in the natural and physical sciences. You get lots of opportunities for hands-on experience to examine, question, and draw conclusion from evidence in the lab. In my first year, I took essential chemistry classes where I was introduced to the principles of science I still use in my studies today, in both practical and demonstrative classes within the chemistry building. Another amazing space is the Sydney Nanoscience Hub for quantum research and computing. Nanoscience is the study of the structure and function of materials on the scale of nanometers. This is one billionth of a metre, or roughly the size of about 10 atoms in a row. The building is designed with nanoscience research in mind, so the labs are floating, this means the lab floors are built on concrete slabs separate to the superstructure of the building to create a stable environment so that the research is not impacted by any vibrations, including any movement from the train line, which is over a kilometre away. That just shows how sensitive this equipment is. Inside the quantum lab clean room, the air is completely replaced every 68 seconds. This room is 100 times cleaner than an operating theatre. The yellow light that you see in the clean room is designed to prevent exposure of light sensitive materials used in lithography processes, which is part of the manufacturing of nanostructures. The next place I want to show you is the Veterinary Teaching Hospital and Farms. We are ranked first in Australia and 16th in the world for veterinary science. The teaching hospital is a great place for our students to learn with treatment rooms, a surgery, dental theatres and imaging spaces. Our vet animal bioscience and agriculture students also gain hands-on experience at our other teaching locations, including the Camden campus. This is where you can work with large animals and wildlife. Agriculture, food and agribusiness students may also get to learn on our farms located in regional New South Wales. We also have a partnership with Taronga Zoo for those of you interested in wildlife conservation. Now let's head over to the Charles Perkins Centre or as we call it, the CPC. Built in 2012, the CPC is a multidisciplinary research centre committed to improving global health. Researchers span across areas including science, engineering, arts and social sciences, as well as medicine, to work together to address major health and social issues like cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Charles Perkins was a civil rights activist who dedicated his life to achieving justice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. In 1966, Dr. Charles Nelson Perkins was the first Aboriginal man to graduate from a university in Australia. His work, which made such a great social impact on the future of Australia, embodies the spirit of the multidisciplinary work being done at the centre. 
Finally, we have our One Tree Island Research Station. This satellite campus has one of the highest levels of protection as it is within the World Heritage listed Great Barrier Reef, which makes it an excellent location for conducting teaching and research activities. You may head out here if you are studying marine biology or geosciences. The research station has been managed by the University of Sydney since 1974. The research at the station has focused on climate change and bleaching, eutrophication of reef systems, carbonate chemistry, geology, sedimentation, and the ecology of reef organisms. Well, thanks for joining me on this tour of the science faculty. We hope to see you on campus soon. with us Aishi who completed her undergraduate degree. Welcome back to UCIT TV everybody and right now we're talking science. So right now we have Aishi who completed her undergraduate degree in medical science and is now completing her PhD. So Aishi could you explain to us where you started with university and how you ended up doing a PhD? Mm, um, thanks Roddy. I, I will take you guys I guess to the end of high school which is kind of where my um, yeah, that my thoughts sort of started. Um, so in high school, I never really enjoyed science. I was more so sort of into history and the languages and so forth, but I kind of knew that I always wanted to study medicine. Um, and so that was kind of, that was my end goal, but I knew that I didn't have, first of all, a passion for science and second of all, any like scientific underpinning. Um, so my thought in terms of coming into university was to undertake a Bachelor of Medical Science to give me, I guess, a taste of what medicine might be like and also to um, bring my skill set up to, I guess, so that I could study medicine. Um, so I came into a medical science degree with basically no knowledge of the basic sciences. Um, so it was a little bit tricky in my first year, sort of catching up and, and learning about like basic chemistry, basic bio and that sort of thing. Um, but I discovered in my second and third year that I absolutely loved it. It was like the only thing I thought about, the only thing like I did in my spare time. Um, and so it was a really beautiful sort of awakening of my interest in the sciences. And I have all my lecturers and professors to thank for that. Um, and so sort of coming to the end of my Bachelor of Medical Science, I was still really passionate about medicine uh, and it's something that I still want to do to this day. Um, but I ended up undertaking an honours project, which is in a science degree, it's kind of like one year of research that you do in a, a research group or a research lab. Um, and I fell into the most amazing group of researchers and I was doing a, a project that I loved so much. And it again, kind of awakened that passion for research. Uh, and so off the back of my honors project, I chose to start a PhD. I'm like six months in, so I'm very, very new to it. Um, but yeah, that was sort of my progression, sort of just at each step of the way, figuring out, you know, I really like this and, and now I'm here. So. That's the, the long answer. Awesome. So we're going to go to some of the questions on Slido. And for those of you who don't know Aishi, she's very passionate about research. Um, so one of the questions here is, if I study science, do I have to go into research? Um, so not at all. I think it's it's definitely a an avenue, as I have found myself, but it's one of many, many avenues. So I kind of, I like to think of the science degree as like a springboard to like any career and I might be naive but I think what what I got at least out of a science degree not so much as um like in terms of the theory but more so the skill set was just being able to kind of like find things out and think logically and rationally and deduct sort of deduct the truth from all of the information that we have and I think that's a something that every um i guess career avenue has and of course it's science is important or like research is a one of the avenues but then you have things like going into more practical elements like you can do postgraduate studies in medicine um in like physiotherapy anything health related um and then there's also going into business and industry um and sort of you know using again science as a, as a springboard into say like a consultancy sort of area or any anything that requires like um data research or that sort of thing yeah 
Right. And of course, you can springboard yourself into research just like I should. Now, another yes. thing very quickly upvoted is, is it possible to change science courses in the first year? Is it possible to change science courses? Hmm. So at UCID, I guess we have a Bachelor of Science, and I'm, I'm going to assume that question is asking, is it possible to change kind of like avenues? Um, and so when you come into a Bachelor of Science, you choose, say, a major. My major was um, biochemistry, uh, but you can definitely change that as you go. So I think I first put down neuroscience as my major when I was like 18 and really didn't know what science was. Um, and then, yeah, in my second year, I, I chose to, to specialise in my biochem. Awesome. That's great to hear there's so much flexibility in the degree. Mm -hmm. um, so our final question for you today, Aishi. Is there a very big difference between the Bachelor of Medical Science career pathway and the Bachelor of Medicine degree? Mm. I would say yes, uh, in the sense that, so first of all, we offer medicine as a postgraduate. Um, so it's a doctor of medicine, meaning that you have to have an undergraduate degree before you go into it. Um, and so I guess the doctor of medicine, which is the postgraduate degree, um, is sort of the, the progression to becoming a, a doctor. And there's other things you've got to do after that, of course. But the Bachelor of Science sort of um, steers you more towards um, like being a, a scientist. So you can come into a Bachelor of Medical Science and then, then go on to a, a Doctor of Medicine to become a doctor. But in terms of like the career outcomes you have as a Bachelor of Science sorry, medical science student, it's it's more steered towards what I was mentioning before, the research, or using it as like a springboard onto other avenues. Beautiful. And thank you for correcting me, Aishi. There's actually no Bachelor of Medical Science at the University of Sydney. It's only a postgraduate doctor of medicine. So thank you so much for your time, Aishi. Next up, we're going to have the Faculty of Arts and Social Science, where Tilly will be chatting with our second panel. But before that, let's take a really quick tour of the Sydney College of Arts. My name is Ali Johnshire and I'm currently completing my honours in a Bachelor of Visual Arts at Sydney College of the Arts. I was drawn to SCA firstly because I love art. I wanted to learn how to think like an artist and also because I wanted to develop my creative practice in a studio-based environment. Today, I'll be taking you on a tour of the Old Teachers College and some of SCA's facilities. The Old Teachers College is one of the most beautiful historic buildings in the campus and it is also the home of Sydney College of the Arts. It was opened in 2020 and contains world-class specialist spaces and workshops across different mediums. Students can pursue anything from screen arts to glass blowing to jewellery to painting. I myself am a painter, but I've also worked in print, in video and in installation. Our specialist facilities give students the breadth to experiment in different mediums and gain specialist expertise to support their work. The glass workshop is one of a kind in Sydney. It offers opportunities for glass blowing, hot sculpting, glass fusing, and flame working. It's got one of several kilns, a furnace, and sandblasters. Our ceramic studio encourages individual expression using clay with 14 pottery wheels, kiln rooms, slip casting, and mold making facilities. It allows students to create technically accomplished and really impressive works. Our print and photo media studios use traditional and digital processes such as etching, screen printing, chemical photography, and the use of still and moving image. These are not just used by students, but also by our teachers and academics, many of whom are also practicing artists themselves. We hope to welcome you to campus soon and show you these incredible spaces in person, but until then, thank you so much for joining me and I can't wait to see you at SCA next year.
welcome back to the virtual quad, everyone. I have here with, with me Merla and Nate from the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Now, Arts and Social Sciences has over 45 different majors to choose from, so no two arts degrees really look the same. Nate, first up, can you tell us a bit about your degree and what you chose to study? Hi, everyone. So I'm doing a combined law degree, um, and within my arts degree, um, I chose philosophy. So during school, I was sort of um, always the kid asking why we ask particular questions, so I was a little bit annoying. Um, but I sort of chose philosophy on a whim. I did um, an elective course in my first semester, absolutely loved it, and I stuck with it. And now I'm doing my honours in philosophy before I go back to law. Fantastic. Merla, what about your degree? So I'm actually also doing a combined arts and law degree um, and then within arts I was doing the international and global studies stream. Um, so specifically I majored in government and international relations um, and I minored in Spanish and I chose to do that because I was really invested in having quite an international career, um, you know, maybe living overseas and hopefully that'll still happen at some point and I just thought studying that would set me up um, to have a career exactly like that. Wow, three arts law students in a <laughs> seminar. How will you ever get us to stop talking? Um, so first up, maybe I'll just throw to Nate. What is the coolest thing that you've gotten to do because of your degree? I would say through my honours program that I'm doing this year, I've, so I'm currently examining the impact of norms and ideas that we, or just assumptions that we make about beauty and the impact of that on the way that we make environmental policy and the way that we look at the environment. So I think one of the great things about the arts faculty is that you're always encouraged to question and to make your own contribution. So that's probably the best thing that I've found from my arts degree, just being able to put my theory into practice for myself. Wow, fantastic. Merla, what about you? Um, I would say go and exchange. So I think that's something that you can do in a lot of different degrees, but I think especially arts degrees lend themselves very well to actually studying overseas at a different university. Um, so I actually spent six months studying in Spain, in Madrid, um, and doing a lot of my international um, relations and politics classes over there. So, you know, getting to learn about Catalonian independence with people who had lived through it and so on. Um, and I think that really enriched my university the experience. Wow, that sounds absolutely incredible. Um, I'm definitely jealous that I haven't been able to do any um, exchange yet. So we'll throw it back to Nate. Is your degree what you expected and why or why not? I would say yes and no. So I was, well, I, I was, I was getting in, into it for the rigour with philosophy. I knew that it was going to be hard. Um, I, knew that it, I knew that it was going to sort of push me. But what I didn't know is how much flexibility I'd be able to have in terms of choosing lots of different subjects. So in addition to philosophy, I've been able to do subjects at the Conservatorium of Music. Um, I've done English units, um, psychology. So that's through the science faculty. Um, I've done a unit in economics. So I think in a way I've been able to specialise, but also get a, a sort of broad understanding of all these different subject areas that I, that I otherwise would not have been able to have a look into. Wow, that sounds really incredible. Merla, what about you? I think my answer would be quite similar. I think while some subjects were very much how I expected them to be, others weren't. And I, you know, especially I think coming out of high school, a lot of these university subjects sound very abstract and, you know, you read them in the course guides, but you have no idea what you're actually getting yourself into. And I think an arts degree is the perfect vehicle to get to pick and choose and try a bit of everything, especially if you're doing a more generalist just arts degree rather than a specific stream. Um, in your first year, you can actually pick one subject from every kind of major, work out what you're super passionate about and then specialise later on. So I think it's the perfect option if you're not quite sure where you want to end up yet. That sounds absolutely fantastic. Um, so talking about not sure where, where you want to end up yet, I might throw to Nate, what do you want to do after university? And have you had any sort of experiences that might have, you know, kind of kickstarted your career plan already, so to say? Good question. Um, I think for the moment, I'm looking to get into intellectual property. So, so it's kind of through my law degree, but I've gotten a bit more of a passion for helping people achieve their creative intentions. So I'm sort of looking towards that and sort of protecting that, which I got through my philosophy degree and through all those different electives in the arts. 
Um, and and um, in terms of um, career bit, bits that have sort of kickstarted me, um, I got a job through the Careers Hub, so, so through, through the UC Career Centre at a, at, a, at a small commercial law firm, which has given me a bit of an insight into what it might be like to work in the industry. So sort of taking that experience and, and running with it, and I don't know how it would go, but um, yeah, that's my plan for the moment. <laughs> um, Merla, what about you? So I'm actually also pursuing more of a career in law um, and I just started a job actually at a big commercial law firm and you might think that oh what is an arts degree got to do with that but I've actually found the skills I learned in that degree extremely useful to help me get to where I am now. So I really want to pursue an area of law called international arbitration. Um, so doing international and global studies has been the perfect background to help me get there um, and learn kind of the skills and cultural competence um, and the awareness of geopolitics and so on that really comes into play in an area like international arbitration. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for, for um, speaking to us, Merla and Nate. I would just like to say that as an arts law student myself, I actually want to go in the other way. I don't want to use my law degree for my career. I'm very happy to stick with my politics major. So, you know, you can we can have it both ways. Um, not all going to be end up lawyers, um, as, so to say. So uh, those tuning in, don't go away because next up, Rady will be talking to one of our economics students. Um, don't forget yet to submit your questions to the Slido and we will see you in just a minute. First up here is a video. As part of Sydney's reimagined undergraduate experience, the Bachelor of Economics and Bachelor of Advanced Studies combined degree is your opportunity to have greater choice, gain essential new skills and be a career ready graduate with two degrees after just four years of study. Get ready for a career in industry, government or global organisations through our four primary majors, economics, financial economics, econometrics or agricultural and resource economics. You will also have a new level of access to a second field of study, making it easier to combine your interests and passions. Take a second major from the School of Economics or choose from more than 90 different majors across the university. Want a major in international relations alongside your major in economics? or a second major in banking, or perhaps data science. It's now easier than ever. You'll also engage with our exciting new interdisciplinary open learning environment units and undertake real world projects that help bridge the gap between theory and practice. And in your fourth year, you can either undertake advanced coursework, including honours in economics and project work in your desired field, or pursue a research pathway. With more choice, a global perspective and enhanced graduate outcomes, studying economics at Sydney is better than ever. Welcome back everybody to our Ask Me Anything with an Economics student. Now I'm delighted to welcome my fellow friend Adam, who is also studying in the School of Economics. So let's start with the question all our guests want to know. Tell us a little bit about your degree and why you chose it. Hey Roddy. Um, so I chose my degree based on the subject that I did in high school. Going through, I never really had a long-term plan about what I wanted to do after school or in university. So when I was choosing my subjects, I just sort of thought, what things might I be interested in going forward. I ended up having a fantastic teacher in year 11 and 12 and I really enjoyed and clicked with the content. And so that pointed me towards a degree in economics. So it, it's got a lot of different areas, some of which I expected and some I didn't. So there's your typical sort of microeconomic um, areas of study where you look at individual industries or firms, macroeconomics where you look at the entire economy as a whole and things like inflation and interest rates. And then there's also things that I didn't consider, consider like behavioural economics, where you look at why people make decisions and things like that. So it is really diverse and I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, I'm surprised. Economics is really much broader than what I thought. And um, we're just going to go to the slider questions. One that's being upvoted is, is the degree what you expected and why, why not? Yeah, so it's, it's really a yes and no answer to that. So my expectation was just sort of an extension of the the high school subject that I took. Um, and it absolutely has been that. I've learned those same concepts in greater detail um, and I have a lot more knowledge in those areas. Um, but then the things I didn't expect are things like using data to build predictive models and, and looking at sort of policy analysis and things like that I didn't really expect. 
Um, and then, as I mentioned before, the the behavioural economics and the um, the decision making side of things, because at the end of the day, economics is still a social science. That component I didn't really expect either, but I'm I'm loving all of it. Awesome. Now, Adam, tell me, what job can you get with economics and what job do you want to do after university? Yeah, there's so many different options. I don't know exactly where I want to go with it. I still have a bit of time to figure that out and hopefully I'll, I'll get there soon. Um, you can do things like working in, in consulting for private firms. Um, there's lots of opportunities in the public sector looking at treasury or policy analysis. Um, I personally think that sort of economic forecasting is going to become very important in the near future, sort of looking at um, all, all the changes that have happened over the past couple of years and people having a lot of uncertainty and not knowing what's ahead. I think that that could be sort of a big up and coming field. Yeah, definitely with the COVID situation, economics will be much more important than it was a few years ago. Um, so another question that's coming in on the Slido, which countries can you go to for exchange? I'm assuming specifically for economics. Yeah, um, economics is um, really fortunate in that there are a lot of partnerships all over the world. Um, one in particular is a degree program that we have, um, the, the Sciences Pro Economics degree, which we run in conjunction with a university in France. So that's definitely an option where you can study um, two years in Australia and then the final two years of your degree over in Europe. Um, but aside from that, you can do shorter term exchanges pretty much anywhere in the world. Um, there are lots of opportunities. Sounds super exciting. I can't wait for both of us to be able to go and exchange again once lockdown is over. Um, so Adam, what are some of your favourite university experiences at UCID? Oh, it's hard to narrow it down. Um, there's been a lot of great experiences. I think one of the best ones would be a subject that I took in my second year. Um, it was actually a science subject, so it wasn't directly related to my degree, but it ended up being um, really interesting. We got to look at um, the potential future impact of climate change. And we ended up working in virtual reality and building a model of the Sydney CBD, which we then flooded with the potential sea level rise of um, what could happen if sort of global warming continued along its current trajectory. Um, I was actually able to use some of the data analysis and econometric techniques that I'd learned within my degree um, to, to work through some of the data that we collected through a survey in that subject um, to sort of see the differences between different groups of people and how they responded to our model and viewing the potential impact of climate change. So that was really interesting and something that I really enjoyed doing. And Adam, are you involved in any clubs or societies on campus? Yeah, so clubs and societies do look a bit different these days, um, obviously running online for the most part. I am a part of the UCID um, EconSoc with the Economic Society, um, and they run a lot of great events. There are some things happening sort of quite regularly. They do fun little trivia nights um, and info sessions. They also run a lot of events with industry professionals um, and partners of the university. So it's a good chance to get to know people and sort of get your foot in the door somewhere um, so that you have some connections with people after you do graduate. Um, so I'm not heavily involved with that one, but I do like to jump into their events when I have a chance. Cool. And just our last question I'll take from Slido. What are you studying this semester? This semester, so I have a couple of subjects from my second major, which is financial math. So I'm looking at a few, um, a, a couple of subjects on stocks and other financial derivatives, um, which some people interested in economics might be keen on. Um, and then my economics subjects are one looking at the impact of poverty um, and why that's sort of a really deep issue and, and some of the issues with trying to combat it. Um, and then my other subject is a advanced macroeconomic subject. So again, sort of looking at the economy as a whole and, and how we can analyze that effectively. Thank you so much for your time, Adam. Next up, I'll be talking with some fellow medical students about the Doctor of Medicine program. So make sure you submit your questions via Slido. But first, let's hear a little bit about the Faculty of Medicine and Health. Which sport and fitness course is right for you? Chris is an exercise scientist. He specialises in designing and implementing physical activity training programs for healthy people in their workplaces. He also instructs and evaluates training plans for people at the gym. Rachel is a sports scientist. 
She works with athletes in a professional basketball team to improve their sporting performance through technique analysis, recovery practices and nutrition and injury prevention plans. Mai is an exercise physiologist. She specialises in the delivery of exercise and lifestyle programs for people affected by injuries as well as the prevention and management of chronic conditions. Eli is a physiotherapist. He specialises in the assessment, diagnosis, prevention and treatment of people with movement problems and acute and chronic disease using a range of drug-free techniques. Step forward into your career as a health specialist sydney.edu.au slash health sciences. Here's five reasons why studying medicine health at Sydney could be the perfect choice for you. Number one, you'll be ready to join the future health workforce. Next year, I'll be a dentist. In two years, I'll be working as a speech pathologist. We get hands-on training as soon as uni starts. So expect to be using the latest treatment techniques on your classmates and using specialised equipment from week one. I'm a medical imaging student, so I've been practising using imaging facilities like X-ray, CT scanners, MRI machines, that sort of thing. I know that by the time I graduate, I'll have tons of new skills to take with me into the workforce. Number two, you're in good hands. The University of Sydney has been producing world leaders in health since 1856. If you've been to a hospital or a pharmacy or a dentist, chances are you've met someone who studied health right here. That's because our graduates are the most employable in Australia and among the top four in the world. Many of the schools here are ranked number one in Australia. Number three, this place. The Susan Wakehill building is on our main campus. It's been purpose built with some really amazing facilities and clinical spaces. There's so much under one roof and within walking distance to major hospitals and other leading health institutes. We get to visit these places to do clinical placements and learn from practicing clinicians. Number four, we work with other health students. There are more health courses here at Sydney than any other university in Australia. This means we get to work with students from all disciplines of medicine and health, just like we will when we graduate. So students doing physio team up with students from pharmacy and occupational therapy. We experience how different areas of health work together to make people's lives better. Number five, learn from leaders. We get to learn from lecturers, practicing clinicians and researchers who are experts in their field. They bring their real world knowledge to the classroom and they're passionate about teaching the next generation of leaders. That's you. If you'd like to find out more about studying medicine and health here, make sure you visit our website. We hope to see you on campus soon. Welcome back to UCT TV, everybody. I'm here with my fellow medical students and future doctors, Ellie and Thomas. Now, before we get started, I just want to remind everybody that at the University of Sydney, we only offer postgraduate medicine. So if you want to know how to apply, there is actually a mini lecture at 12.30 p.m. today where you can get all those details. But once again, let's go back to our stars with our the very first question. Ellie, can I start with you? What's it like studying medicine? Thanks, Radhi. Um, I suppose that question is answered in two different ways, the live portion and then the online portion. Um, my personal favourite is the live portion. I love going into clinical school, doing the anatomy pracs and all those kind of things. Um, and those have continued on within this uh, COVID setting, which has been great. The online setting is unique as it is for all degrees, but um, a lot more self-directed. So we have a online video day in first year where we have pre-recorded lectures already uploaded and we can take those at our own pace, but then the other online materials are live delivered. Um, but so far I'm really enjoying it. And Tom, what do you enjoy most about your medical degree? Yeah, um, I'll have to agree with Ellie. I think being this early in my degree and already having clinical experience with real patients in hospital settings is, um, is insane. And it's really breaking the ice early so that we have the opportunity to be uh, really good doctors by the time we graduate. Um, I think what I also enjoy is the cohort. I think we have a really um, welcoming and diverse cohort of people who um, come from all different backgrounds. So like Radhi was saying, um, we have, um, medicine as a postgraduate degree. So we have people from all different disciplines coming together. Um, and I think it's really 
um, interesting learning alongside people. I definitely agree with Thomas. You get people from different walks of life that are at different stages and have really various backgrounds. So we'll go to some Slido questions now. And Ellie, I'll start with you. What are the next steps after graduating from a medical degree? Yep. So there's a pretty strict sort of structure once you graduate from any medicine degree. So firstly, you start out as an intern in a hospital. Um, and what that means is essentially you're just working at the hospital that you get placed at. So in New South Wales, that system is a preference-based system. It doesn't uh, depend on your marks or anything like that. And you can preference the city or regional and rural areas. Um, and that whole year is, again, just to extend your clinical exposure and protect you. I suppose you're a new grad. You're not fully ready to be able to do everything and anything and gives you that opportunity to work with um, all the different doctors across the whole range of the hospital. And then after that, you um, are a reg or a residency. Is that correct? <laughs> um, and that's your second year. So PGY2 is often what it's referred to as postgraduate year two. And beyond that, it really uh, depends on where you want to take your medical pathway. So if you want to specialise, certain specialty programs open up to you um, after PGY2. Um, but if you want to continue just working within that hospital setting, you can and then determine whether you want to specialise a little bit later. You can go and become a GP and that's also another specialty pathway. It really all depends uh, what you want to do. Yeah, like Ellie said, it's very broad and you really don't have to choose your medical specialty anytime soon. Uh, Tom, I'll just ask you a question from Slido. What can I do if I don't get into the double degree medicine course that UCID offers? Yeah, so the double degree course at UCID um, is a very competitive course to get into. There's only around 30 places per year and it is um, reserved for um, people who do achieve that 99.95 ATAR or 99.90 if you get in through E12. So it is very difficult to achieve that, but rest assured, um, only 30 places. Um, so it's not the end of the world because um, the current cohort um, of, med of medicine at UCID this year is over 300. So a vast majority of people don't get in through that double degree. Um, so if you don't, you have to study an, a, an undergraduate course anyway. Um, and so you can just apply to medicine by sitting the GAMSAT. Um, and, you know, in, in the perfect world, that won't actually add any length of duration to the degree. Um, but, yeah, I think if you don't get into the double degree, it's not the end of the world. You can reapply. Um, and for me personally, I like being able to do an undergraduate degree first. Um, that's my personal preference. Awesome. Ellie, let's go to you. Do you get to work with patients and where and how do you do it? Yes, for sure. We get to work with patients. As Tom was uh, saying previously, one of his favorite parts of starting out med is one day a week in the clinic working with patients. Um, and what that involves is we go into our hospital. So there's quite a few different hospitals that um, the university is paired with. And then we uh, practice, for example, history takings. So that's where you go into a patient's room and ask them questions about their health and sort of elicit information about why they're in hospital. We also do really basic physical exams in first year. So, for example, testing someone's knee for osteoarthritis. Um, and the clinical exposure just builds builds as the years go on. So Radi's now in second year. He has three days of clinical exposure, which is spread across general practice as well as the acute hospital setting and allied health as well. And then by fourth year, we're pretty much all in the clinic. Yeah. Okay. So we're just going to wrap it up now. Thank you so much for your time, Ellie and Thomas. Our next interview will be with two students. One is studying architecture and the other design computing. So remember to submit your question via slider for that. But first, we're going to have a series of videos about applying to the University of Sydney. And after that, we'll have the design, modelling and fabrication labs before heading into our next interview with Tim. So see you soon. Dreams. We're all born with them. Dreams of adventure, of finding a sense of purpose, meaning, of reaching our full potential. And wherever your dreams take you, your journey starts with Iraq.
I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Hi, my name is Georgia. I am a Community Engagement Officer at UAC and today I'll be answering questions about offers and preferences. The first offer students may receive from UAC is through the school's recommendation scheme or SRS. SRS is an early offer made to students and this assesses your year 11 studies and a school's rating. To be considered for SRS, you need to apply by midnight on the 19th of September and have the order of your preference list confirmed by midnight on the 4th of November and then the offers are released on the 12th of November. For students wishing to apply for an early offer through SRS for the University of Sydney, there are additional requirements and eligibility criteria. In addition to your Year 11 studies and schools rating, a student must also be eligible for specific disadvantage codes within the Educational Access Scheme. Students are also required to upload supporting documentation to their University of Sydney preferences in their SRS application. To change your preferences, you'll need your UAC application number and PIN. You can log back into your UAC undergraduate application via the Manage Your Application section of the Apply page. When you've entered your details and logged back into your application, from there you can edit your preference list. So you can rearrange the order of your preferences, you can change your preferences, and you can delete and add new ones into your list. Make sure if you are making changes to your preference list that you do this before the change of preference deadline in the offer round that you're hoping to get an offer. So for SRS offers, this deadline is midnight the 4th of November. And for offers based on ATAR results, the first deadline is midnight the 18th of December. You can change your preferences as many times as you like, and there are no additional fees to change your preferences. You should list your preferences in the order that you want them to be considered. So at UAC, we always say, put your dream course first. Then you can list the course that you would prefer to do next in your second spot, and so on and so on. You can list up to five preferences in your UAC undergraduate application. If you're not made an offer to your first preference, then we'll look at your second preference and then your third and so on. It's important for you to have some variation in your preference list when it comes to the selection rank or ATAR needed to get into your listed preferences. It's always a good idea to have a plan B, whether you put your plan B course in your second spot or further towards the bottom. Having some plan B courses or pathway courses towards the end of your preference list may maximize the chances of you receiving an offer to study. You may receive one unconditional offer through your SRS application. This means that you've met all of the conditions to receive an offer and you can enroll in this course if you wanted to or you may receive one or more conditional offers. A conditional offer means that the university really likes you, they want you to study there next year, but there is a condition that you'll need to meet before you can enroll into that course. An example of a condition might be meeting a minimum ATAR before you can enroll into that course. If you've received a conditional offer, you should leave this preference as your highest eligible preference in your list. Your application will be checked to confirm if you've met all the conditions following ATAR release. So your conditional offer may convert into an unconditional offer on the 22nd of December. If you have received an offer, you will receive an email from us at UAC advising you to check your application. Or you can log into the undergraduate offers section of the UAC website. You'll also need your UAC application number and PIN to log in. UAC only assesses your application according to the rules and criteria set by each university. Each university decides who receives an offer.
So for SRS applicants in November, you may receive one unconditional offer or one or more conditional offers. This is the only offer round where students may receive more than one offer. Following ATAR release, you may receive one offer per offer round. However, there are multiple offer rounds, which you can try for an offer. So following December, we have two rounds in January, two rounds in February, and one round in March, where you can try again for an offer or perhaps try and get a second offer. If you don't receive an offer in an offer round, you can try again in the next one. This is an opportunity for you to review the selection ranks or ATAR needed to get into each preference in your preference list. If you're not sure where you can find these, if you're researching courses on our course search page, you can click into your desired course and then at the bottom of the course listing, we will always list the selection ranks students needed to get an offer into that course last year. Keep in mind for your year, selection ranks don't remain the same. They do change from year to year. However, a selection rank is a good indicator to show you if you're competitive enough to receive an offer into that course. So once you've checked out the selection ranks, you may wish to make some changes to your preference list. This might be putting in new courses that have a lower selection rank, or it might be putting in some plan B courses or pathway courses into your list as well. Remember that many universities offer pathway courses, which may lead you into your desired university course later on. And if you want to know more about what is the best pathway for you, it's best to speak with the university to get the correct advice. If your ATAR is too low to receive an offer into your dream course, please don't panic. There's plenty of options for you. Start exploring your plan B courses. The university you wish to attend may offer a pathway course that can lead you into becoming eligible for entry into your dream course later on. Keep in mind your selection rank may still be competitive enough to receive an offer into a lower level qualification at a university college. For example, if you didn't get an offer into the Bachelor of Engineering, you may still be eligible for an offer into the Diploma of Engineering. Then after you've successfully completed your Diploma of Engineering, the university may guarantee you entry into the Bachelor of Engineering. But this is just an example, so keep that in mind. You could also complete vocational education or training. This might be at a private college or at a TAFE. And then once you've completed that new qualification, we will assess your new qualification for entry. If you are exploring a path course into your dream course just keep in mind that admission will change from university to university so please do your research and make sure that the pathway course that you are choosing will allow you entry into your dream course later on To receive a further offer in subsequent offer rounds, you first need to accept the offer that you've already received. Then you can log into your UAC undergraduate application and go to the update course preferences section and move that course down to the bottom of your preference list or remove it entirely. Then log into your UAC undergraduate application and go to the update course preferences section and move that course down to the bottom of your course preference list, or you can remove it entirely. As long as you've accepted the offer, you can't lose it. Then if you've received an offer from your new course preference list, you can decide whether you want to accept it and withdraw from your original course, or you can choose not to accept your new offer and keep your place in your original course. This works the same for SRS conditional offers. If you have a conditional offer and you're not sure if you want to have that at the top of your list, you can move it to a lower preference in your list and then you'll be automatically considered for the higher preferences in the next round. So just to recap, to change your preferences, log into your UAC undergraduate application and go to the update course preferences. And that's all the common questions we receive at UAC about offers and preferences answered. If you have any further questions or you would like clarification around anything that I've spoken about today, please get in touch with UAC. We're always here to help you. You can contact us on our Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube pages. You can call our customer service team or send us an email. We're always happy to answer your questions. 
Thank you for watching. My name is Jack and I am the Student Recruitment Coordinator at the Sydney Future Students team. Today, I'm going to take you through some of the key terms you'll need to understand when applying for undergraduate study at the University of Sydney. If you are a domestic student, you'll need to submit an application through the University Admission Centre, otherwise known as UAC. The one exception to this is if you are applying for one of our two dual degrees with Science Po. In this case, you'll need to apply directly to the university. If you are an international student, you can choose between submitting either a UAC application or applying directly to the university. You are considered a domestic student if you are an Australian or New Zealand citizen, either a permanent resident of Australia or a holder of a permanent Australian humanitarian visa. If you don't fall into one of these categories, you are an international student. In our guides and on our website, you'll see that we list selection ranks for entry into our courses. Simply put, your selection rank is your ATAR plus any additional adjustment factors that you may receive. You can receive adjustment factors through an eligible admission scheme such as the Academic Excellence Scheme, Future Leaders Scheme, or the E12, otherwise known as the Early Offer Year 12 Scheme. Adjustment factors are sometimes called bonus points. If you are not eligible for adjustment factors, then your selection rank will just be your ATAR. Guaranteed entry applies to your first eligible offer round. For students completing the New South Wales HSC, this will be UAC's December round two. For students completing an interstate qualification, guaranteed entry will apply to the first UAC offer round that you are eligible to receive an offer for. For most students, this is usually January round one. Some courses do not have a guaranteed selection rank and instead list an indicative rank. These selection ranks are a guide and are marked with an asterisk. To be eligible for admission into these particular courses, you may need to achieve a higher selection rank depending on the demand for that particular year. If you do not meet the guaranteed selection rank for your desired course, you may still be eligible to receive an offer depending on the availability of places in the course. For some courses at the University of Sydney, there may be additional selection criteria with which you will need to meet. Some examples of this are the personal statement for education degrees, a portfolio for visual arts, auditions for music, or an assessment day for undergraduate entry into our medicine and dentistry courses. This will be listed on the course page if this is the case. The maths prerequisite applies to some of our courses like advanced computing, commerce, engineering, and science. This was brought in because historical data has shown that students do tend to do better in these courses when they have studied mathematics in high school. For the HSC, you'll need to achieve either a band four in mathematics advanced or a band three in mathematics extension one or two. Standard mathematics does not qualify. If you want to find out more information like which courses have the math prerequisite, what your interstate equivalent is, or your options if you do not meet the maths prerequisite, then head over to our website for more details. The New South Wales Education Standards Authority, or otherwise known as NESA, requires students applying for teaching degrees to meet a prerequisite. This prerequisite is a band five in three different HSC subjects, which is between 80 and 89 marks. One of these subjects needs to be either English Standard or Advanced or the equivalent in your state's qualification. This applies to all our teaching degrees except for the Early Childhood Stream. From 2023 onwards, primary school teaching will also have mathematics as a prerequisite. If your degree lists assumed knowledge, this means that your lecturers will start teaching you under the assumption that you have studied these subjects at the Year 12 level. Assumed knowledge is not a barrier to entry, but if you do want to brush up on these areas before commencing your degree, we do offer bridging courses to help get you up to speed. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we wish you all the best.
Hi everyone, my name's Charlotte. I'm a student recruitment assistant at the University of Sydney and today I'm going to share with you some tips for our interstate students. All states have their own tertiary admissions centre. If you're a domestic student applying to the University of Sydney, then you'll need to apply through the University Admissions Centre or UAC. The one exception to this is if you're applying for our Sciences Po dual degree, in which case you'll need to apply directly to the university. There are 28 institutions in New South Wales and ACT that you can apply for through UAC. In order to apply through UAC, you'll need to create a login, add up to five preferences, and this is also where all your offers will come through to. Make sure that you apply for the early bird discount, which expires on the 30th of September. All international students can apply through UAC or directly to the university. Interstate students can apply through UAC from the 1st of August and will be eligible to receive offers in January for round one. Head to the UAC website for more information. Interstate students are eligible for most of our admissions pathways and we encourage you to research and apply. Our admissions pathways are all included out on our website and include the eligibility and application process for each scheme. For example, if you achieve the equivalent of a band 5 in advanced English, you may be eligible for adjustment factors to help you get into your dream course. However, this isn't very helpful if you're unsure of what a band 5 comparison is in your state. Head to the UAC website to see a full table of comparison for Year 12 qualifications. All interstate students applying for the University of Sydney will need to meet all additional admissions criteria, including any prerequisites for the course. If you head to our website, you'll be able to see eligible subjects and grades for all Australian secondary qualifications, including the IB and GCE A-levels. Moving to a new state can be especially daunting. However, the University of Sydney has some fantastic accommodation options to help you settle in and feel right at home with the fantastic community on campus. The university owns housing in and around the main campus. These are called university residents. All accommodation options come furnished with your own bed, study, desk and wardrobe. Depending on which accommodation style you pick, you may have a shared bathroom, kitchen or backyard. There are seven college style accommodation options which are affiliated with the University of Sydney. Colleges assist with academic study through mentoring and support and provide all your daily meals and opportunities for co-curricular and social activities. There are also independent housing providers like Urban Nest, which allow you to live off campus and still enjoy the atmosphere of other university students. Finally, you might choose private accommodation or a share house. If you're thinking of this option, it's important to consider a few things, including your budget, the proximity to campus, and what public transport would be available to get you to the university. Living on campus means you'll have access to sporting, social, and cultural events all year round through your accommodation. The University of Sydney has over 200 student-run clubs and societies, giving, me the, giving you the opportunity to meet other students and learn new skills. The university also has 40 inclusive and social sporting clubs, including everything from rock climbing to table tennis. Thanks everyone for joining us. Good luck with your upcoming exams, and we're really looking forward to seeing you at the University of Sydney next year. Hi, I'm Beth Downey, and I work in Sydney Future Students. Today, I'm going to take you through the basics of the Mature Age Entry Scheme at the University of Sydney. So the first question, of course, is am I eligible? So you're eligible to apply for admission to the uni through the Mature Age Entry Scheme if you, number one, will be 21 or older on the 1st of March of the year in which you commence study. Number two, either did not receive an ATAR or if your ATAR was below 70. And number three, if you have not done any tertiary study. If you're eligible for the scheme and you would like to apply, then you need to complete what's called a preparation program. These can be comp completed either at New South Wales TAFE or with a university provider. And you can find a list of approved programs on our website. It is important to note that many of our bachelor's degrees will only accept a specific program or will require you to take specific subjects within that program. And this information is also listed on our website. Finally, keep in mind that entry is still competitive. Places are, are awarded based on academic merit and simply completing the preparation course is not enough to guarantee entry. If you don't meet the criteria for the mature age entry scheme, that is okay. 
we accept a range of recognised qualifications. These include secondary education qualifications, including all Year 12 Australian certificates, like the HSC or the VCE, or an equivalent international qualification, like the IB, SAT or A-levels. Even if you completed high school years ago, you can still apply using these results. If you've already been to uni and completed at least one year of full-time study, then you can use your uni results to apply. We may also consider the results of a completed diploma or advanced diploma, including vocational education and training qualifications, if these were accredited by the Australian Qualifications Framework. You can find a comprehensive list and more details on the Recognised Qualifications section of our website. Thanks for joining me. Remember, if you have any questions or if you're not sure about applying for the Mature Age Entry Scheme, you can always contact the university and we'll be happy to help. Today, I'm going to take you through some of the key information you'll need to know about postgraduate study at the University of Sydney. First, it's important to understand the basic difference between undergraduate and postgraduate study. Undergraduate degrees are the first degree you undertake at uni. At the University of Sydney, this will be your bachelor's degree. On the other hand, the vast majority of postgraduate degrees will require you to have at least completed your bachelor's in order to apply. Postgraduate study can also be broadly divided into two categories. These are postgraduate coursework and higher degrees by research, or HDR. Postgraduate coursework has a similar structure to undergraduate degrees in that you'll attend lectures, have tutorials, and you work on projects and assessments. These courses can be offered at a graduate certificate, graduate diploma, and master's degree level. A graduate certificate is the shortest option and is typically completed within six months full time. This will usually cover some of the core units that you'll find in the master's degree. Graduate diplomas expand on this knowledge and are typically completed within one year. And then master's degrees provide you with specialized knowledge and skills and usually take between one to two years to complete. In many disciplines, there is the opportunity to start in a graduate certificate or diploma and then progress to the master's at a later stage, though this is not true across the board. We offer hundreds of disciplines within the postgraduate coursework space, including areas like commerce, public health and social justice. Degrees like the Doctor of Medicine or the Juris Doctor, which is a postgraduate law degree, also fall under the category of postgraduate coursework. The admission criteria for postgraduate courses will be listed on the specific course page available on our website. There is quite a bit of variation between degrees, so it's always important to check the details. Admission criteria could include the completion of an undergraduate degree, and this could also include previous studies in a particular discipline, a minimum grade point average in your previous degree, relevant professional experience, a portfolio work, or health and security checks. One example is a doctor of medicine, which in addition to several other criteria, requires applicants to take an exam called the Graduate Medical School Admissions Test, or GAMSAT. Another example is the Master of Physiotherapy, where applicants need to provide evidence of pre-existing knowledge in the areas of human anatomy, human physiology, exercise physiology, and neuroscience. Higher degrees by research include qualifications such as a master's by research or a doctor of philosophy, more commonly known as a PhD. In these highly regarded degrees, candidates conduct independent research and write on an approved topic in order to produce a thesis which presents their research and findings. Applying for HDR is a comprehensive process. However, the four basic steps are, number one, determine your eligibility and a suitable course. To be eligible, you'll need to have undertaken a significant research project or thesis in your previous uni studies. This could be the equivalent of an Australian Honours degree, a Master's by Research degree, a Master's by Coursework degree with a thesis component or a dissertation, and your academic performance in your undergraduate degree will also be considered. Step number two, develop your research proposal and find a research supervisor. You'll need to carefully consider the subject of your project and start to develop a proposal to provide to potential academic supervisors. Your research and thesis will probably evolve with time, but the initial proposal must actively show why your research is noteworthy and how it aligns with your proposed supervisor's own work. Step three, funding your HDR study. 
For domestic students, you do not need to pay tuition fees as this is covered by the Government Research Training Program Fee Offset. Fees do apply if you are an international student. However, depending on your research project, many students also work part-time to fund their study, similar to how undergraduate and postgraduate coursework students will. We also have one of the largest research scholarship schemes available in Australia. Step four, gather required documentation and submit online. HDR applications are open all year round, and we recommend applying as early as possible prior to your intended start date. You'll also need to discuss your start date with your supervisor. Thank you for joining me for this short video about postgraduate study. If you have any more questions, please get in contact with the university and I hope to see you on campus soon. Hi there, my name is Ruby and I am currently a third year student studying the Bachelor of Design and Architecture. If you're undertaking an architecture or design degree, it's important to have a space where you can turn your ideas into a reality. So, I'm going to show you our design, modelling and fabrication lab, or as more commonly known as the DMAP lab. Inside the lab is a broad range of workshops which allow students to produce their own prototypes, objects and models. What I really enjoy about the DMAP lab spaces is seeing my design works really come to life, with equipment and materials that I otherwise wouldn't have access to. I have learned a number of new skills all throughout my degree that I will continue to use into my future. And don't worry if you don't know how to use the machines. There are a number of inductions to complete, as well as the friendly DMAF staff always being there to help you. First up is our 3D printing, which is something a lot of us might have heard of, but don't have access to. We actually have a range of different 3D printers. Depending on your project, you can print in materials like plastic, resin, or powder. We also have a 3D printer farm, which works 24 seven to manufacture designs, models, and anything else you can imagine. You can even send in your design file from home and the lab staff will print it for you, ready to pick up for the next day. I personally have not used the 3D printers, but I know that it is a priceless tool used by many students to bring otherwise complicated 3D designs into fruition. Next up is the laser cutters, which are some of the most popular machines in the lab. These machines cut in 2D and work on wood, cardboard and plastics. The machine directs a focused laser beam at your material, which then either melts, burns or vaporizes away, leaving an edge with a high quality finish. The advantage of laser cutting over mechanical cutting is that you can build an intricate design using software to then produce very precise pieces of work. For example, I cut long detailed trusses in my most recent project, at a scale of 1 to 200 which is actually quite small. This process would have been a painful and long exercise by hand, but with the laser cutter I was able to create templates straight from my computer and cut them quickly, efficiently and most importantly, accurately. Next, we have the robotics section. In design and architecture, it's important that you not only develop your traditional crafting skills, but also your knowledge of the state of the art technologies. Here, students are encouraged to experiment with the design process and see what might be improved by robotic fabrication. This gives us the potential to shape the future of robotics in the creative space. For example, the lab houses five KUKA robotic arms. This equipment is usually found in an industrial setting, but these machines have the potential to break new ground in the field of creative design. There are subjects that you can take as design students to learn how to code and utilize these robotics to introduce you to the 2D and 3D processes that are involved. Finally, let's look at the Media Labs. This space offers technical support and equipment for 2D and 3D media. Students have the opportunity for hands-on experience with a variety of materials and techniques. This allows you to explore the connections between traditional media and more recent developments in fabrication. A great example of this is 3D clay printing, which combines traditional media with modern technology. In first year, I used these labs to create clay moulds and learn how to use this technique of soldering to create conceptual models based on the movements of people. It was a tool I had never used or even heard of before, but I was able to utilise the space to learn and create my ideas safely. Well, that's it from me. Thank you for joining me on this quick look at the design, modelling and fabrication labs. I hope to see you on campus soon.
Here's five reasons why a degree in design computing could be the perfect choice for you. Number one, future-proof your career. The digital world is changing so fast and you've got to keep up. I concentrated on design theory and technical skills when I was at Sydney and I think this gave me a big advantage. I work at a global design agency and they're really impressed with the students coming out of this degree. We've got loads of grads working here. Number two, get a great job. I'm a senior developer and technical coordinator at PwC. I'm a visual designer at One Thin Vinalto. I'm a user experience designer at IBM. I'm a senior product manager at Atlassian. I'm an intern at Google. Design computing grads are always going to be in high demand. Even before leaving uni, many are being headhunted by small startups all the way through to big multinationals. This degree is recognised all over the world, which means I can basically work anywhere. Number three, do cool stuff. In my internship at Google, I was a user experience designer in the Android Google Maps team. I used what I've been learning in my degree every day. You see why the app does that? I designed that. Number four, it's the only course of its kind in Australia. This is the only undergraduate degree in the whole country that gives you a specialised training for a career in interaction design and creative technologies. Number five, it has the best grad party ever. The graduate exhibition gets more than 5,000 visitors through its doors and it's a chance to get your work in front of a wider audience. You network with employers and you really graduate with a portfolio that gets you noticed in the industry. Hello and welcome back to UCID TV. I have here with me Sabrina, who is studying design in architecture, and Hannah, who is studying design computing. Sabrina, let's start with you. Can you tell us about what your a bit about what your degree involves? Sure. Hi, guys. So the Bachelor of Design in Architecture is first and foremost really a design-based degree um, with a really strong basis in architecture, obviously. So typically people who study this degree want to go into that sort of architecture field, um, you know, becoming a registered architect. Um, but also, you know, there are plenty of opportunities to go into things as varied as, you know, installation, art, um, gallery, art processing, all the way through to, you know, like uh, uh, engineering and well not engineering but more the sort of um, engineering side of things as well so the degree is very practical it's really hands-on um, it's based around what we call studio which is a really fun day where you basically have uh, maybe five or six hours in your in your studio group with your tutor and your peers um, to work on a project so you generally have one studio project per semester and that really allows you to I guess um, have a really strong, um, focused, really in-depth uh, project that you work on for a full semester. Wow, that sounds absolutely incredible. Um, over to you, Hannah, what does a design computing degree involve? Yeah, totally. So design computing is a really, really fun and unique degree. So personally, I think it's great for students who kind of, they like coding and technology, but you don't really want to go and study computer science. And if you like a little bit of creativity, but you don't want to be a graphic designer or something like that, design computing is that middle intersection where you're able to be creative and play with really cool technologies without those kinds of, um, <clears throat> sorry, higher standard, not high standards, gosh, sorry, um, without those kind of um, pressure and stuff like that. So yeah, um, day to day, it's also studio based, like um, design and architecture. So you do have one whole day where you spend the whole day really hands hands on working with your tutors, creating these projects that then you have um, large projects that you're able to display and put in your portfolio. And then that's going to help you get hired. And fun fact, design community is our most employable degree at University of Sydney. Wow, that's really interesting. So that actually, funnily enough, perfectly leads on to our first Slido question. So what jobs does design computing lead to? And where do you think you'll end up, Hannah? Yeah, super good question. So yeah, as I said, design computing is ranked number one for graduate employability out of the whole university. So there is so many different jobs that you can go into, as we just saw in that great video there. Um, the number one would be a user experience designer, which is a really versatile role. Um, a lots of different firms are hiring user experience designers, and that also lends itself to consulting as well. So you're able to consult with other organizations on how they can improve their user experience. But I personally, um, I have a grad job next year where I'm going to be a business banker. And even though that's a bit different to design computing, I was told that the skills that I have from design computing are super valued. And even though I don't have the business knowledge, they can teach that to me, but they can't teach those really unique strong design thinking and critical thinking skills. So even if you don't want to go into specifically a user experience career, design computing equips you with really good skills for lots of different careers. Wow, that's absolutely incredible. I think you're convincing me to change my degree. Um, so on to you, Sabrina. We've got another question in the slider. Does the Bachelor of Design in Architecture make you an architect? 
And also, where do you think you'll end up? Really good question. So the path to becoming an architect in Australia is a little bit sort of long and convoluted sometimes. Um, basically, what you need to do is study any three year undergraduate course. So people often choose to do the Bachelor of Design in Architecture. We also have the Bachelor of Architecture and Environments, which is another really valuable undergraduate course. So you study that for three years, and then you need to apply for the Masters of Architecture, which is another course that is offered at a postgraduate level at the University of Sydney. The Masters of Architecture is a two year long course. Once you do that, then you need to work in practice for two years. So two years of full-time work in the architecture field. After you've done that there's basically it's a test you need to do um, with the you know Australian Architectural Accreditation Board once you've passed that you can then call yourself an architect so it is a little bit of a process and it does require a few steps but it is uh, definitely very um, once you're at university at least it is it is very clear in front of you you know they do help you along the way for me personally um, I'm hoping to sort of get a little bit of work started in the architecture firm, um, architecture world, sorry, part-time whilst I pursue further study. So I'm hoping to sort of um, go maybe into, a, uh, at the moment, a more residential architecture um, type pathway, which is what I've decided I'm interested in, which is really funny because when I started the architecture degree, I didn't think that uh, I was actually interested in residential architecture. I was far more interested in um, sort of big picture public works programs, but it's through this um, degree in my time and my subjects I've taken that I've decided um, that I think the place I want to go to first, at least, is um, residential architecture. Wow, really cool. Um, I know a lot of students, well, prospective students, people who are thinking of studying these degrees, they don't just want to know about the actual degree itself, but they also want to know what life is like around it. And if you've had any cool or fun experiences that could be linked to your degree or not even really linked or maybe linked to hobbies. So Hannah, do you have any um, fun experiences linked to university that you would like to talk about? Yeah, well, funny enough, Sabrina and I are both on the same student society, which is the um, Faculty of Architecture, Design and Planning Student Society. So on that, I am the role of the design computing representative, which means that I represent all the design computing um, students. And this has been really fun because we're able to kind of have a foot in the door with the faculty and get to make um, our concerns and anything heard to the faculty. So I've really enjoyed that aspect of being able to enjoy, be a part of kind of the managerial aspects of the faculty and just kind of be a part of planning events. And if any students have any queries, being able to be in a position where we can escalate that to the faculty. It's just been, yeah, really rewarding. Wow, fantastic. Sabrina, what about you? Yeah, so I'm actually the president of that society, um, which has been a really great honour and privilege for me to pick up that position this year. So um, in that role, you know, I've, get, I've gotten to have a really great understanding of sort of leadership, um, you know, faculty, student liaison, that type of role. But also it is just a really fun position. You know, we get to plan the parties, we get to plan networking nights, we get to um, basically really make student life uh, super involved and super fun for students. You know, that's a big thing about the architecture faculty that I've found. Um, you know, you spend a lot of time at university, so you get really close to your peers. Um, you know, there's always fun events to do. And it's um, the student life for me has probably been the, the biggest thing I've gotten out of university, you know, whether that's been through the architecture society or also different um, hobbies and um, things I have as well. Wow, absolutely fantastic. So we're going to be wrapping up in just a second. Um, just quickly, one sentence each. Has the degree been what you've expected it to be? Um, we'll start with you, Hannah. Yes, and 10 times more. Great. Sabrina? I would say I didn't really have many expectations about it, um, but the ones that I did have, definitely it has exceeded them. That's absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for your time, Hannah and Sabrina. Um, for our next interview, I will be chatting with a student from the Gadigal program. But before that, we will go, we're going to see an overview of admissions pathways available at the University of Sydney. So if you have any questions about our admissions pathways, head over to the admissions hub in the Course Advice Centre. Thank you so much once again, ladies. Thanks, Tilly. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tyrone. I'm an Outreach and Access Officer with Sydney Future Students. We're going to look at access schemes and pathways. Entry schemes take into consideration your achievements, your location and your circumstances. We then apply adjustment factors to boost your selection rank. Your selection rank is your ATAR with any adjustment factors. 
keep in mind that even if you meet the selection rank for your degree, you still need to meet any additional requirements set by the university, such as prerequisites, an interview, a portfolio, or an audition. Some competitive courses offer fewer adjustment factors or will be excluded from an entry scheme altogether. This information is all listed on our website, so be sure to check that out to make sure that your dream course is included. Another important thing to know is that adjustment factors don't stack, they don't accumulate across schemes. You can apply for and be eligible for many schemes, but we will only use the adjustment factors from one scheme, and this will be whichever scheme is the most benefit to you. If you are a domestic student studying advanced or extension English or advanced or extension mathematics, you may be eligible for our academic excellence scheme. To qualify, you must achieve a band five or six or the extension equivalent. If you're successful, then students can receive up to five adjustment factors through this scheme. There's no application required. The adjustment factors will be automatically included in your selection rank if you've achieved the required result and apply for an eligible course. The Future Leaders Scheme is for school captains and duck students throughout Australia. This scheme is in recognition of your leadership and academic achievements. If you are the school captain, then you need to submit your application before the deadline in November. The duck student is the student with the highest ATAR in their Year 12 cohort. The duck does not need to have applied because they will be automatically considered for this scheme. The Broadway Scheme is the University of Sydney's Educational Access Scheme for domestic high school students. If you have experienced significant educational disadvantage during Year 11 and 12, we encourage you to apply. You may be eligible for up to 10 adjustment factors depending on your course. Applications are made through UAC and further information can be found on their website. If you are a domestic student and attend a New South Wales regional or remote high school or have experienced financial hardship during year 11 and 12, you may be eligible for our early offer year 12 or the E12 scheme. Through E12, you can receive an early conditional offer with a lower minimum ATAR. You'll also receive a scholarship and additional support to help you transition into university. Applications are made through UAC Schools Recommendation Scheme, SRS, and they close in September. If you are an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander University of Sydney, our Gadigal program provides a pathway to your preferred course and support along the way. Applications can be made through UAC with further instructions and support available on our website. If you're an elite athlete or performer whose training, competition, or performance requirements may have impacted your HSC preparation, then this scheme allows you to receive adjustment factors to increase your selection rank. To be eligible for this scheme, you must fill in an application which includes a personal statement, letters of reference, and information regarding the hours that you spent training or rehearsing. Applications close in October and they are open to Australian citizens and permanent residents. If you're a domestic student interested in our music and visual arts courses, you might be eligible to secure an early offer through the Creative Arts Special Admission Scheme. In order to apply, you'll need to participate in an early audition round or submit your portfolio before the early offer deadlines. If you're not successful in this scheme, you can still receive an offer in later rounds. The Portfolio Admissions Pathway is for domestic students interested in architecture and design computing degrees. If you are expecting to receive an ATAR of up to 5 points lower than the cutoff, you can submit a portfolio of work and potentially still receive an offer. Your portfolio should include a sample of your creative work, a personal statement and a letter of reference. From all of us here at the University of Sydney, we hope that your preparations go smoothly and that your journey is full of adventure.
a place to meet and be yeah. together in our culture. I could meet other students like me and spend meaningful time with elders. To have an environment that is a hub for Indigenous students and staff who are there to support them is something that grounds us, keeps us connected. A place to feel supported within our own studies as we celebrate and incorporate culture into our learnings from across the university. It sets us all up for success and leadership well into the future. This space allows us to celebrate our people and share what is the world's oldest continuous culture with others. I was lucky enough to find a pathway to the University of Sydney through the Gadigal program, and I'm excited to see other students come through the same pathway to achieve their higher education goals and share in the same opportunities as I have. As an artist, my culture is a source of inspiration. To have a centre that nourishes and celebrates this just enhances my practice and my passion. Throughout the generations, there have been numerous Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander scientists, and this has inspired me to continue with my studies. My home is over 2,000 kilometres north of here, and to find a sense of place so far away from where I grew up is so important for me and my family. To have a centre that nourishes and celebrates this just enhances my practice and my passion. It's a balance of function and technology, alongside space to reflect and recenter. It's our place. It's our place. It's a sense of belonging that is something really special. This space not only allows for us to continue our education, but also give us a place where we can connect and share our teachings with each other. Being a student is a time of self-discovery and to be amongst like-minded and inspiring individuals in my growing community shapes the culture of our future. The University of Sydney has an amazing reputation across Australia and the world, so to be able to have access to the world's best faculties and academics sets us up for success and leadership well into the future. We're proud to open the Gadigal Centre. Yours, ours, theirs. Yours, ours, theirs. Yours, ours, theirs. Yini, yani, nanu. Always was, always will be. Hello and welcome back to the virtual quad everyone. I am here today with Leroy, a fellow student from the Gadigal program and one of my best friends that I've made so far at university. So the Gadigal program is our Indigenous student pathway that supports Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander students to study at the university. So first up, Leroy, when did you become involved in the Gadigal program? Well, that kind of starts off from the summer program from a few years back and it cuts into when I first met Tilly um, when I think I was in year 12 and she was in year 11. And it was a program that kind of got me involved and actually let me understand that I can actually get into university because I never thought I really could before. And so from there, um, me and Tilly have been chatting out and we ended up doing the Gadigal Alternative Entry Pathway System. And then I got into University of Sydney and then from there on, I've just been involved with all the programs around it. Yeah, I know you are a very active member of the Indigenous community on campus. So what are the benefits of applying for the Gadigal program? So there's a lot of benefits in the Gadigal program, which can come from financial to emotional and, phys and physical support. One of the best parts was allowing me to get a cheaper accommodation where I got a accommodation scholarship, which helped me alleviate a lot of the problems of just moving away from um, a country town, as well as financial support when I needed it and a lot of emotional support as well. And when the program first started, there were workshops that helped me get used to studying on campus, meeting new people and just getting ready for how to do university uh, tier essays. Yeah, absolutely. What about, um, would you be able to talk about how the ATAR is shifted for the Gadigal program? So the ATAR is, a, it's a bit um, case by case for the Gadigal program. And so for me, I only got a 70 ATAR for my course. However, for a Bachelor of Arts, I needed, I think it was like an 80 or an 85. And so it can be case by case and it can be anywhere from like five to 10 to 15 points, depending on the availabilities in classes um, and courses. But it is highly recommended to go for the Gadigal Alternative Entry Program for any kind of courses you might want to get into, because this is extra bit of benefits as well as those scholarships that come with it as well. Absolutely. Now, do you want to get, talk a little bit about ITAS? 
Oh, ITAS is actually one of my favorite programs that the, the Gadigal program does. And so what ITAS is, is essentially just a tutoring program where they give you two free hours of tutoring per class each week. And so you can utilize these tutors, which are anywhere from professors to other students doing PhDs to, to, to honors areas. And it's very vital for some of those times when you really need that support and you really need to get through those pretty tough classes. Yeah, I know myself, I have absolutely loved having, having that tutoring available. Um, so I also wanted to ask, what sort of experiences have you had at university that you've found particularly fun, exciting or useful? Well, so one of the best things about the Gadigal Alternative Entry Pathway is that it brought all Indigenous students from that year cohort as well as above together in so many kind of events from cultural events to um, just social events and hanging out. And so from there, it's allowed me to really grow and flesh out who I am and my kind of identity, as well as just finding out all these events around the place. And so just learning and growing with these people, going on adventures, studying together and just learning so much about ourselves, our culture and our degrees was just this beautiful experience. Absolutely. And you've spoken about meeting new people, but I just want to ask, can you tell us a little bit about your own story? My own story. <laughs> so um, I'm a Kamilaroi man, born and raised in the Mid North Coast in Kempsey. And so it's the Dungadi Nation. And so I'm the first in my family to go to university and not many people in my family have ever had opportunities to do that. And so I'm currently studying a Bachelor of Arts and I'm a fourth year student majoring in international relations and social legal studies. I um, <laughs> like hanging out with friends, going to gigs and just exploring myself and everything else around there. And I think it's a beautiful experience to just be able to come so far and, and meet so many amazing people, go on so many amazing experiences. And uh, I'm really excited to see where my degree takes me. I'm hoping to work in government afterwards and probably get into politics and just see what I can do for my people and all of us in Australia. Yeah, absolutely incredible. So is there any advice for students you would give um, who are thinking about applying through the Gadigal program? Uh, my best advice, apply early and apply fast. The UAC it jumps up to $200 past September. And so you want to keep that $70 aspect, but also just apply for any kind of scholarships you can get, apply for many accommodations, residences, just keep applying yourself to everything and just believe in yourself because you know, you never know what could happen. I never thought I'd get into university and here I am four years in. <laughs> absolutely incredible. I know that I've had a very similar experience to you. The Gadigal program has absolutely changed my life. So thank you so much for your time, Leroy. Have, it's been an absolute pleasure having you with us today. It's um, my pleasure too. Thank you, Tilly. <laughs> in just a few moments, I'll be joined by Jake Gordon from Sydney Future Students to talk about the new extended bachelor's degree program for Indigenous students. We will be back in just a moment. My name is Jackson Connerty. I am a Gamilaroi and Wanarua man. I'm currently studying my first year of the Doctor of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Sydney. Previously, I was in the Bachelor of Veterinary Biology. Since then, I've progressed into the Doctor of Veterinary Medicine. So to progress into the DVM, I needed to get the right marks, high marks, a 75 average. Key to this was my time management. I needed to manage not only my studying, but sleeping, eating healthy and exercising. My pathway into vet science, I suppose, would have started when I was a kid. I kind of had that dream that, you know, I want to be an animal doctor. I've always owned like animals, like dogs and lizards. A childhood dream that just didn't go away. So in high school, I didn't quite think I would get the marks and for vet. My dad was always that guy that was like, well, what can you apply for? What's out there? You should just go for everything. Because why not? That was what my dad was. So he always pushed me to do those kinds of things. I spoke to my year advisor and she mentioned to me the category program and what it entailed and I applied for that and that ended up getting me into veterinary science. I am one of the first people in my family to go to university. Being one of the first people in my family to go to university, my whole family are very proud of me and keeps me inspired or keeps inspiring me to keep going through university and to keep working hard. I do have two younger brothers and a younger sister. They see me doing what I want to do and being able to do what I want to do. Hopefully that inspires them to do what they want to do. So at the moment, I'm living in a suburb called Randwick. I live at a vet clinic, so it's a live-in position. Pretty much this just means that I live there, I pay rent there, but also work there at the same time. So a few weeks ago, I went to the United States to Washington State for a leadership course called the Veterinary Leadership Experience. This was run by the United States Veterinary Leadership Institute. 
This leadership course was actually sponsored by the universities. It was a pretty big thing for me going overseas and I mean, I was a little scared at the time because I was like, oh, you know, I'm by myself, traveling for like 24 hours to a place I've never been before. Really glad for the opportunity. I'm really glad that I went. My end goal is to be a practicing vet. I know finishing my degree within this line of work is only the beginning though. I know you get out there and there's a whole ton of other things you have to learn. That's exciting to me. I always like learning new things and I suppose that's why I got into vet. It's always evolving and changing and there's always something to learn, which I think is a big motivator for me. Hello and welcome back. I am here with Jake Gordon, Engagement and Partnerships Manager at Sydney Future Students, and we will be talking about the new extended bachelor's degree program. So Jake, first off, just wanted to ask, who is the extended bachelor's for? Hey Tilly, how are you going? And hi everyone watching at home, or oh, I would guess you can't be anywhere but home at the moment, so I guess everyone's at home. <laughs> um, so the extended bachelor's program is for our Indigenous cohorts, so Indigenous future students of Sydney um, that are, look, um, are looking to enter Sydney through another pathway program um, and maybe not ready to commit to full-time studies just of yet. Um, in terms of the bachelor's degrees that we have on offer as part of the extended bachelor's, um, we have a Bachelor of Arts, which is extended, um, a Bachelor of Liberal Arts and Sciences, a Bachelor of Science and a Bachelor of Science with Health Components extended. So these degrees are built for those who, let's just say your ATAR requirements, unfortunately, fall below the bar for the degrees you might be looking to enter in through. Um, and then they also give you the opportunity with exit opportunities. So after the first year and second year, you can leave with a diploma of a foundation studies and an advanced diploma of foundation studies respectively. Wow, incredible. That sounds like a lot of info. Um, so on from that, how can students who are looking to apply, how do they get more information on this? Sure. So the best thing to do is to reach out to um, myself and our team here. Um, at Sydney and that's indigenous.recruitment at sydney.edu.au. Um, you'll find that plastered all over the, if you type into Google and you forget, just type in University of Sydney Indigenous Pathways and you'll find our email splashed all over the place um, and you can get in contact with myself um, and there's um, two other uh, um, Indigenous staff members who look after that inbox that can provide you the cultural support and leadership that you need um, on your journey into applying for these positions at the university. Absolutely incredible. So I know you've touched on it a little bit, but could you please flesh out mainly what is the real differences between the extended bachelors and the Gadigal program? Sure. So the Gadigal program, that's our early offer program for Indigenous students. Um, our non-Indigenous uh, program is uh, the equivalent is the E12 program. Um, so for the Gadigal program, where that where that kind of sits is that's your opportunity to present to us a whole bunch of information that we generally don't pick up through mainstream application processes. Um, and also um, as an equity cohort, we get to have a look at your um, your application as a whole, your connection to your community. Um, and it's about more than just your ATAR. So um, that's where Gadigal sits. Um, and Gadigal also gives you the opportunity to come in at a lower ATAR um, because we know that your academic output isn't just reflective of your ATAR. You know, you might just be having an off day when you have your exam. And especially this year, there's a lot going on. Um, so we totally understand how you're feeling at home. Well, we don't understand, but we're trying to, um, and we're trying to adapt to that. So in terms of the extended bachelors, um, that's say, let's say you apply for or Bachelor of Arts and you unfortunately don't meet the cutoff, you can apply for the Bachelor's of Arts Extended and you can come in on, um, on a reduced course load for that first year. So um, there is an additional year of study involved, but a part of that is you get all of the cultural support, you'll get access to ITAS as we just discussed, um, and, and there'll be a lot more um, learning and development opportunities for you. And as a part of that, if you don't live in Sydney, this is what I really love about this degree, is that you come for uh, six one week placements at the university. So you don't have to spend your entire time with us at the university, um, and this gives you the opportunity need to, to go home and work and do all those other things that you might um, want to do rather than committing to a full-time study load.
Wow, absolutely crucial. Thank you so much for giving us that information, Jake. And students, if you would like more information, feel free to reach out to that email address that was provided. Thank you so much once again, Jake. Next up is our segment from the Faculty of Engineering and Computer Science. Radhi will be back soon with an interview with some engineering, advanced computing and project management students. But first, we'll have a quick look at engineering at UCID, including our industry partnerships. Currently, we are going to be the first Australian university team to attend the Spaceport America Cup, which is next month. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Airbus were looking to extend their Global University Partner Program into Australia and selected the University of Sydney as the only Australian university to participate because of its well-regarded aerospace engineering program, its great relationship with industry, a focus on diversity and it also recognised the importance of digital competencies in their graduates. We've been able to send two students back to Cranfield in the UK for an Airbus Innovation Summer Academy where they learned about innovation and disruptive technologies. We've also supported the Sydney Women in Aerospace program and we're supporting the Fixed Wing Autonomous System Transition Racer program, which will help develop students across their four years in aircraft design, aircraft systems, aircraft integration and navigation systems. We've been able to engage with a wide range of students and encourage them to develop their skills so that they will be employed in the aerospace industry. Hello, engineering students. Welcome back to UC TV, everybody. I'm here with three fellow engineering students, Miguel, Emma, and Adele. So we'll start with you, Miguel. So you study advanced computing. Can you tell us a tiny bit about that degree? Yeah, definitely. So I do advanced computing, and I actually do it as a double degree with uh, commerce. And advanced computing is really, it, it really focuses on the more theoretical aspect of uh, programming and coding and things like that. So you can really consider it more of a kind of math degree in a way. Uh, I get a lot of questions asking me, like, what's the difference between doing something like software engineering as opposed to um, obviously computer science or advanced computing? And that's mainly the answer I give. But yeah. Beautiful. Now, Emma, you're studying engineering, but you also do project management. What a combo. Can you tell us what that's like? Yeah, that's right. Um, so throughout my degree, I've been able to study a combination of chemical engineering subjects and project management subjects. And the course has been organised really nicely um, to allow for me to keep up with my chemical engineering cohort and friends, uh, whilst also gradually developing my project management skills and meeting new people from various different degrees, also studying project management. Finally, Adele, you study space and mechanical engineering. Can you tell us a bit how that works? 
Yeah, for sure. So the space major is really cool. I study mechanical engineering as my stream of engineering in the same way that other students might study software engineering or civil engineering. Um, and so that's my base degree. And then I take space subjects, three of them throughout my degree and a couple of specialist courses too. Um, and they're taken with a bunch of uh, aeronautical and mechatronic students as well. But a really cool opportunity to kind of play with satellites and whatnot. Oh, thanks, Adele. That sounds fun. So we might go to some questions on Slido and we'll start with Miguel. What can you do with a degree in computing? So you can do quite a few things with a computing degree. I think the main one that comes to mind is a software engineering degree. I know I mentioned that there was a big difference, but you could still do a software uh, engineering role, even if you just did comp sci. So think things like working for companies, big tech companies, the obvious ones are like Google, uh, things like that. And also you can do a lot of things that don't really involve coding with a computer de uh, computing degree. The things that you actually learn in computer science or advanced computing are logic, um, understanding of new technologies, buildings, uh, building things with new technologies. So really anything that has to do with logic, you can apply your computer science degree into it. Uh, things with math, so you are opened up to trading routes. There are a lot of new financial um, companies that want people who do computer science based on that. Uh, and I think it's just a really broad degree. Uh, and it's personally something that a lot of employers look into. So maybe you want to do AI as well. That's the thing that a lot of people are looking into as well. Definitely lots of demand for computing and software jobs nowadays. Absolutely. We might go to you. What are the engineering facilities like at UC? Is this for me as well? Uh, sorry, we'll go to Emma. Yeah. yeah, so there's a number of great facilities at UCID and there's actually a new building. Um, the new engineering precinct is currently being built, so it should be ready really soon for all of our new students to come. And I myself am really looking forward to checking it out, checking out all the new chemical engineering labs and biomed labs as well. Excellent. And we have a follow-up question for you from Slido. What sorts of things do you study in project management? Yeah, great question. Um, so you study a variety of aspects of project management from scheduling to costing and budgeting, as well as all the phases of a project from project planning to project execution. Um, and also involves, the course involves a lot of group work, which is great because when you are a project manager, you're going to be working with lots of teams and groups. Um, and yeah, it's organized very well and covers many aspects of projects. Okay, next question we'll give to Adele. Is the degree what you expected when you started and why, why not? Oh, good question. Um, I think not exactly what I've, I expected, but in a really good way. So when I came in, I was kind of thinking mechanical engineering, it's going to be um, quite hands-on design um, based. And we definitely do a lot of that. We have opportunities to get in the lab and kind of play with wind tunnels and things like this, which has been really fun um, being in workshops and having that side of my degree. But surprisingly, mechanical engineering actually included a fair bit of programming too. Um, and I've kind of picked up a fair bit of that throughout my degree. I've really enjoyed that, um, despite not expecting it maybe at the beginning. Just a follow-up question for you, Adele. What mm -hmm. do you study in space engineering and how many people in your cohort? Sure. So at the beginning of my space cohort, we had about 50 students. Um, <sighs> by the end of the time I'd finished my degree, everyone had kind of changed different pathways and were um, doing different subjects at different times. So maybe we had closer to 35 um, or 40 uh, in space engineering, we started learning a lot about kind of um, space system design, a lot of orbital mechanics, so how things like satellites kind of move in space. Um, and then in our later year um, space subjects, we looked at kind of space project design, so playing with robotic arms in one of our subjects and building our own little baby satellite in um, our last subject that I did last semester. So I kind of think about it as things that are actually in space, not getting to space. Wonderful. Now, thank you so much for your time, Miguel, Emma and Adele. Next up, I'll be speaking to one of our students from the business school. So remember to submit your questions on Slido. But before that, we're going to hear a little bit about the Commerce 
and industry placements attached to it. James, it's great to see you again. Yes, Angela, it's really good to be here. Now tell me a little bit about why did you decide to study commerce here at Sydney University? Well, um, I'd kind of always been interested in finance and that was where I wanted to go with my career, um, looking towards investment banking or asset management as some of the, the possible career options. And I, after a bit of research and talking to some of my older friends who were already at university, I found that UCID would kind of provide me the best combination with of social, academic and kind of industry opportunities, weighed up all my options with, with university and thought that UCID would be the best option for me. That's fabulous. Yeah, I came to UCID as an undergraduate back in the 80s and absolutely loved it. Wow. But I never thought I'd come back here and teach. So here I am. So it's been an absolute wonderful journey. Hmm. Do you want to ask me something? Yeah, well, I'd like to, I'd like to know who should study commerce? Well, I think any student who's interested in business, is interested in understanding how companies operate, is interested perhaps in understanding a little bit about investment banking or wanting to go into a commercial firm such as Qantas or wanting to go into Westpac. And don't forget, studying a commerce degree, the opportunities are so broad. You could actually be a HR manager or yep. an oper operational manager, logistics manager. There's all sorts of roles, I think, available to students if they study a commerce degree. So what is the difference between the Bachelor of Commerce and the Bachelor of Commerce Advanced Studies here at UC? Okay, so the Bachelor of Commerce is a three-year degree in which you're required to do one major and you can choose to do another major or a minor. So a major is just a specialisation. So some of the specialisations we might have, for example, are the banking degree, business analytics, but you can also choose your minor from another faculty, if you like, from the yep. arts and social sciences. So it's a three-year degree. It's a great degree, but the Bachelor of Commerce and Bachelor of Advanced Studies is a four-year degree where you'll walk out with two degrees. So you walk out with a Bachelor of Commerce and you walk out with a Bachelor of Advanced Studies. Four-year degree, in that fourth year, you have the option to undertake an honours year, which is a research project year, or you can undertake advanced coursework. So I think okay. for students, it's absolutely fantastic because it's quite flexible. You don't have to choose to do a Bachelor of Advanced Studies until your third year in your Bachelor of Commerce degree. And I really like how it's it's something you can tack on at the end if you're feeling like you want to stay at uni a little bit longer, or you want to delve into some certain subjects a little bit deeper or do some research, some honours. Yeah. Um, I think it's really great, that flexibility. Yeah. So, yeah. I think it's a wonderful um, option for students to give you an edge when you're actually going out for um, employment opportunities. What have been the best aspects for you, James, studying the Bachelor of Commerce degree? What well, I i got to say, since I came to UCID, my life has totally changed in a lot of different ways. I've, um, in the Bachelor of Commerce specifically, I've found that I've just understood or learned a lot more about how different things in the world are working. I've also kind of expanded my social circle like tenfold. Um, yeah. That's been one of the awesome things that I've that I've really enjoyed about UCID. I think you're up for the next question. Yes, yes. Uh, I was Google me, you, James. Google me. I'd like to Google, <laughs> can you do a major and what are the options? Yes, so in the business school, we have over 11 majors. So for example, I teach on the major, which is accounting major. Very so good. I teach auditing, which is in the accounting major. We actually have finance majors available to students like yourself yep. who are interested in investment banking. We also have uh, probably one of the most uh, popular majors at the moment, and that is the data analytics major, yep. as well as the banking major, which will, will enable students to go straight into the banking sector and have those skills. Yep. Um, of course, we've got the traditional business law major, or business information systems, marketing, of course, which is very popular, mm -hmm. human resources, and and work and organizational studies. So there's a number of majors that you can choose from in the business school. And you can either complement that major with a major like you have from the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences doing an economics ma um, minor or major, mm -hmm. or you can choose another major within the business school. Are there any yeah. exchange opportunities? Oh, are there any exchange opportunities? Yes, there are. There are a lot of programs within the business school that students can choose to do, but you need to, again, plan for it. Yes. So you've got a number of programs such as the industry placement program. We've got a local program and we've got an international program. So you can go to the US, yep. you can go to LA, San Francisco, or you can go to Singapore or China and immerse yourself in a, a short 
placement program with a host organisation. So you have an opportunity of applying your theory to practice, which I think is really cool. Yeah. And you get an idea of, do you really want to get into that type yeah, of organisation? You get a taste. You. I had the opportunity, as a Bachelor of Commerce student, you also have the opportunity to uh, engage in some of the exchanges provided by the United States Study Centre. Yeah. Um, so I, I could do that. I was eligible under the Bachelor of Commerce and they said, um, you know, there was opportunities to go to LA or to Washington, D.C. And I, I actually was able to go to Washington, D.C. and intern in the Senate over there. Does the university have any industry connections? Yeah, the university has many industry connections. I know at the business school, we have a database which has over a thousand connections with various industries. Um, and that can range from a non-for-profit organisation up to one of the top listed banking firms or the top 100 on the ASIC stock exchange. So we've got a number of connections and we've had to strengthen those connections because we've got a number of offerings like the industry and community engagement projects that we do with industry. Yeah. So that's where we're trying to get students to go out to industry with a number of teachers working on a real life project. So our industry connections are absolutely crucial to how we operate mm -hmm. and they're getting even deeper yeah. as we develop more um, opportunities for students to work with people from industry. For example, the DL mentoring program is just one of those areas where we've had to develop more connections with industry because they're going to mentor students yeah. um, in their second year. So there's a lot of opportunities and connections with industry. Yeah. So good luck. Thank you I very hope, much. I hope to see you in the advanced studies. Yes, I look forward to it. Yeah, it'll be It's going to be great. Wheel is work integrated learning, so it's a great opportunity to find out about what is actually going to support your classroom learnings and linking it up with your future career. Students can do placements locally, they can also do placements internationally and we do a China program, we do an American program and we do a Paris program. The program that I undertook this year was the IPP, so the Industry Placement Program, and I did that one uh, a few weeks ago, I finished up about a month and a half ago at Nespresso head office in North Sydney. You get to go to a different country. So when I was in Paris, the students I met, they are excellent, they are very academic, and also they are um, a bunch of fun people to hang out with. I learned a lot about um, project management because everyone's on different internship and different program. So it's very interesting to hear about their internship at the end of the day when we enjoy cheese and wine. I was allowed to present my projects in front of management um, at the end, uh, at around week eight of my um, program, which was really crazy. I really love French culture. So when I was in Paris, I got to eat croissant every day and I get to go to see castles and museum and uh, all the shopping was wonderful. You're always interfacing with so many experts, mentors and professionals in relevant fields to you that you can build this network and take it with you and carry it through into your career after uni. So through the internship I learned about teamwork because I have to work with my supervisor and other interns who is on the same team to achieve the same goal. It's a really great experience, it's a great way of building your networks, it's a great way of actually um, understanding what it's like to work in your chosen industry and maybe sort of getting a bit of career clarification as well. Hey Vince. Hey there. What are you up to today? Just on my way to my advertising class. And where are we? We're in the Abercrombie building, home of the business school. What do you like most about the Abercrombie building? Um, I like how it's new, it's pretty high tech, and it's the best building on campus. Do you get to see your friends around here much? Yeah, definitely. Now let's talk about studying business at the University of Sydney. Why did you decide to study here? Um, I decided to study here because the business school has a reputation of being one of the best in Australia and I really love the flexibility of my degree. What's your favourite thing about coming to uni? Um, I get to choose my own path here and study what I'm interested in, which is pretty good. What majors are you doing? Um, I'm a marketing and international business major. And what do you like most about them? Um, I love the creative aspect of marketing and how international business provides me with the background to work overseas one day. Has there been anything about uni that's been challenging? Yeah, definitely balancing the workload has been a challenge. And what other things do you get to do here? Um, there's actually heaps of things to do here. So I'm part of the executive team for the Sydney University Business Society and I got to travel to Kakadu to work on Indigenous projects in community. Have you got anything exciting planned for next semester? Yep, I'll be heading to the UK for my semester exchange. What are you most excited about for your study abroad? Um, it'll be my first time to Europe, so I'm pretty keen to like, travel, study and live on the other side of the world. 
And what sort of support do you get at the business school? Um, the business school has a very supportive mentoring program, which really helped me in first year. And my tutors and lecturers are always here to help me when I need it. What would you like to do once you graduate? When I graduate, hopefully work in an ad agency or perhaps do marketing or large corporation. And what's one piece of advice you'd give someone wanting to study business? Uh, definitely seize every opportunity and just go for it. Anyway, I'll talk to you later. I've got class. Hello everybody, welcome back to the Virtual Quad. I'm here with Caitlin, DL Scholar and Business School student. Welcome Caitlin, can you tell us a tiny bit about your degree? Hi Roddy, um, yeah I can. So I'm, I'm uh, studying a Bachelor of Commerce and Bachelor of Laws, majoring in finance within the commerce degree. And um, I actually originally started out doing arts law and um, after a year in arts, I decided I was actually quite interested in commerce. So I transferred across um, and started that degree. That's been really fantastic. Can you tell us a tiny bit about what the DL program is like? Yeah, of course. So um, I started university in 2018, which was the first year that <clears throat> DL Scholar was won. <clears throat> and essentially, the DL Scholar program provides you uh, not only with uh, money, like an exchange scholarship to use overseas in overseas programs, but it also gives you access to a variety of units offered to students within the DL program. So I was lucky enough to complete um, the Asian, um, Asian economic community, which was a really fantastic subject that you had students from so many different disciplines. And um, actually last semester, I completed um, innovation and organizations, which was a lot of interdisciplinary work. So I worked in groups with people from engineering, computer science, um, arts, and we worked on projects together that we presented to industry partners at the end of the semester, which is fantastic. Wonderful. Now you mentioned that the DL Scholar has an um, an exchange component to it or opportunity to get a scholarship for exchange. Can you talk a bit about exchange and if you've been on that? Yeah, definitely. Um, I haven't done a full exchange. I've actually done um, an overseas unit um, called an open learning environment unit um, overseas. And so that was called Experience Germany. And so I was lucky enough at the end of 2019, uh, pre-COVID, pre um, I got to go over to Berlin and uh, learn German for three weeks. Uh, and that was just such an amazing experience. Uh, I, with the um, with this scholarship money from DL Scholars that was able to cover some of the costs of going overseas, but then we were overseas. We got to go on so many different activities, so many different day trips, whilst also getting to learn some basic German too. So it was just a fantastic experience. And to also um, be doing that with all of the other fellow DL Scholars and um, other students from the other degrees, it was really fantastic. Wonderful. Now we'll go to some questions from the Slido. So do you get to do placements or work experience in a business degree? Yes, you definitely can. Um, there's, I think in the previous videos, as it was saying as well, industry placement programs where within your degree, you get to go and do almost like an internship per se at organisations and they can sometimes be organisations of your choice. And so that's a really fantastic opportunity to get that practical experience whilst you're also studying the degree as well. And there's also a lot of opportunities for practical experiences through case competitions <clears throat> where you work with a lot of industry leaders and um, major firms um, in the um, to basically respond to real world challenges as well. So that also helps to get some practical exposure. All right, another question from Slido. What are some of your favorite uni experiences, Caitlin? Oh, well, definitely would have to say um, going overseas um, and doing the overseas unit in Berlin was just so fantastic. But I've also really enjoyed, because um, I'm not from Sydney originally and I didn't really know anyone um, in my degree. So getting involved in a lot of the on-campus activities with the societies has been so much fun. Um, this year I was involved in a, um, an investment banking case competition and that was just so exciting to, you know, get to pitch pitch a proposal to um, invest, investment bankers and it was just really exciting. And so that's just been so much fun to be actually, actually able to develop those skills on the side of my degree as well. Okay. Another question. What career or jobs do you want to do after graduating from university? Well, I am doing a double degree. And so I, I am quite interested in commercial law, but it obviously it is a big decision. But I think at the moment I'm very interested in pursuing commercial law. And that's where the commerce has come in. It's been very useful to just have that initial exposure and, you know, getting to learn those, those finer skills and that theory within the fi my finance major. So I'm hoping to use that to work in the commercial space. And I'm also quite interested in impact investing. Um, so, yeah, we'll see where it takes me. Ooh, I like this question. What are the assessments and exams like for commerce? Mm, they definitely vary. So you have your core units and, uh, for instance, Buzz 1000, Buzz 2000, and that can involve a lot of group work and presentations. Um, but for other units, such as uh, for finance, for instance, 
Um, if there are exams, there are uh, assessments that you submit. They're usually for a lot of the finance subjects, there's a final exam that you can sit. Um, and then they do have some group projects as well. So it really does depend on the subject, but there is a variety usually. All right, that's all that we have time for today, folks. Thanks so much for joining me today, Kaylin. And next up, we'll have Tilly who'll be taking talking to one of our music students. But before that, we're going to go on a really short tour of the Conservatorium of Music. Hi, my name is Chris and I'm studying a Bachelor of Music with a major in Vocal Classical Performance and I'm in my fourth year. As a music student, I spend a lot of time at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music. This is located in the Sydney CBD, right next to the beautiful Botanical Gardens and just down the road from the Sydney Opera House. I'm going to take you on a mini tour of the con so that you can see what it might be like if you study with us. Now, if you're a performance student like me, you're probably really interested in our performance spaces. The con has five spaces of various sizes for rehearsals and recitals, including the music cafe, the music workshop, and the historic Verbruggen Hall. Another incredible space here at the con is the library. We have the biggest musical collection in the Southern Hemisphere, with tens and thousands of music scores, books, CDs, DVDs, and even vinyl records. There are also over a hundred study spaces, plus AV equipment, including a record player with MP3 conversion ability. There is also a rare manuscript room, digital music publications, and live streaming facilities available for every student. We also have recording studios and tech labs, two rooms filled with Mac computers with the full range of industry standard music software, including programs like Sibelius, Ableton and Logic Pro. These are available to all students, but might be of particular interest to those of you interested in digital music, contemporary, creative music, or even composition. Finally, what is a musician without their instruments? We have a huge range of instruments, including over 160 pianos, which can be located in practice rooms to performance spaces, over nine drum kits, traditional Chinese instruments, which you can play if you like and want to be involved in Chinese music ensemble. And we also have a registration where you can borrow instruments in case you need a special one for orchestral studies. Thanks for joining me today on our tour of the con. I hope to see you on campus soon. Thank you so much for joining us back at the virtual quad. So to, so we just saw Chris take us on a tour of the con and she's now joining me to talk about her music degree. Chris, welcome. Thank you. Hi. Thanks so much for having me today. <laughs> so first up, can you tell us what it's like to study at the conservatorium? Um, it's definitely an amazing and unique experience. Uh, it's probably the best thing that I could have hoped for when studying a music degree. Um, everything is at your fingertips and the staff are just incredible. Um, they're so experienced, so knowledgeable. So it's an amazing experience all the way through your degree. And what are you currently studying? So I'm doing a Bachelor of Music with a major in vocal classical performance, which basically means I am on the road to becoming an opera singer. Wow, that's incredible. Um, one of the questions we have coming in through the slider is what sort of music degrees are there? There are a lot of music degrees <laughs> at the Conservatorium and quite a few new ones as well. So um, we obviously have a classical major, uh, which you can major in almost any instrument um, in the planet. <laughs> uh, we have a jazz degree. We have a contemporary music practice degree, uh, which focuses on a lot of compositional um, aspects and um, writing your own EP and music, things like that. We have a composition degree. We have creative composition for industry, which is focusing on composition, but more for film and television and um, soundscaping. Um, we have our new musical theatre degree, which is launching next year, which is very exciting. And that is in collaboration with NIDA as well. And we also have so many. We have the historical performance degree. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot to offer. <laughs> Sounds absolutely incredible, especially the one launching with NIDA. Wow. Um, I've got a really interesting question here in the Slido. Someone has asked, do you learn any business skills for navigating the music industry? 
So there is an elective that you can do. Um, it is a part of the jazz course and it's called music business skills. And um, it takes you through how to book a, how to book a tour and how to manage your budget and how you would go about um, basically managing your money as a musician. But we are quite lucky at the con as we have access to all of the S table electives, which means that you can take any elective across um, any subject at UCID main campus. So there's that option as well if you wanted to delve into it a bit more. Wow, that sounds absolutely incredible. And you've spoken a little bit about, you know, delving into the different parts of uni. So are you personally involved in any of the clubs or societies? So I am the current Conservatorium Student Association president, which um, has been amazing, uh, which will be wrapping up in October. I've been on the council for all four years I've been at the con, starting as a first year ambassador in 2018. And I'm also a member of Muse, who is a musical theatre society on main campus and a member of Piano Sock, which um, the CSA have done a couple of uh, event collaborations with this year as well, which has been super exciting. Wow, that's really, really cool. Um, is ha, What's the most fun and exciting thing you've done as part of your degree? Um, I will have to say something from this year. I had the wonderful opportunity to be involved in a new opera that was written by David Reeves. So one of our professors at the university, Narelle Yeo, um, organised and handpicked some students to be involved in this and we got to do a workshop on one of the newest operas from an amazing composer. Wow. Um, okay, so I've had another question coming through the Slido. Um, are students able to book sessions for their personal use outside of class times? And st I mean, studio sessions, sorry. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, so we have a range of studios at the conservatorium. We have uh, practice studios, which are bookable for all students across any degree, which you can use any day or time, including the weekends, of course. You can also book in our amazing um, performance spaces, which include Recital Hall East, West, Music Workshop and Verbruggen, um, which are just state-of-the-art um, performance spaces, which were designed for music students and for the comp. And um, you can also book in our new sound recording studios. Um, they're not new, but they are heavily upgraded over the last year and they just have these amazing facilities, um, which you can use at any time. Wow, that sounds really cool. Um, someone has just asked, what is it like practicing or performing remotely during lockdown? Um, it was a little weird at first last year, I will say. Uh, definitely not what you imagine your performance degree to be like, but I must say that our staff have gone above and beyond to make this um, experience as best as they can for all the students. Um, and it has been really wonderful with the new Zoom update for musicians. Um, so that has been great. My teacher can actually hear me sing high notes now, which is great. Um, and yeah, it's been interesting, but definitely still rewarding. Thank you so much, Chris, for taking the time out of your day to talk to us. I am absolutely blown away about what you've been able to do. It sounds so, so cool. Um, for any of the students asking those more technical questions, head over to the Course Advice Centre because that's where you can get all of those answered for you. Um, so once again, thank you so much for your time, Chris. Next up, Radhi will be talking to the President of the University of Sydney Union, but first up here is a video.
the virtual quad, everybody, and thanks for joining me for our final interview of the day. I have with me Prudence, the president of the University of Sydney Union, otherwise known as USU. Thank you for joining me, Prudence. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and sure. For those of you that don't know, can you explain to us what the USU is all about? Yeah, so we're the oldest and largest student union in the country. Like you see, over 30,000 members. Um, we started off as an, yeah, Oxford and Cambridge kind of debating union at UC in Australia, but then it's advanced now to be uh, all about student life. So we run the parties, the festival, the food outlets, online programs like Trivia. We do, um, we run over the food outlets um, and we have over 200 club societies within the, the USU. So faculty clubs who run camps and balls, but also ethnocultural clubs, religious clubs, political clubs, theater clubs, like sport clubs, all kinds of things. And we're run by students like me. So the first president of the USU is actually the first prime minister of Australia. But we also have like politicians who've been on board. We've had Australian celebrities, um, like bachelor reality TV show celebrities. We've had Rhodes Scholars. Um, we've had the Honourable Michael Kirby. So it's a really great space for student advocacy and student leadership. Wow, that is amazing. I had no idea about that. Um, it was so broad. So I know the USU gets involved in a lot of activities on campus. I see it all every day when I'm on campus. But I want to know, what is your favourite program that the USU runs? That's a great question. I ha it has to be a tie between either the parties that we run at Manning, which are so much fun, and the reviews. I have, I'm biased because I've read the reviews, um, but they basically like comedy skit shows or theatre shows. And I do the law reviews. So there's faculty reviews or there's identity reviews and um, a lot of comedians can come and watch and students come and watch and we've had really incredible people in the audience and we've created really incredible content and if I had to put it like if I had to pick another really incredible program it'd be obviously the clubs. I think everyone um, identifies with the clubs when they think of the USU. It's a lot of the it creates space for people to um, get involved in extracurriculars, to learn new skills, um, to make friends. It's a really important aspect of university life. I'm sure running the USU is a major task, a really big one um, to say. So why did you decide to run for USU president? Um, that's a great question. Um, so I had been involved in student politics for a while. I think, um, you know, maybe like a lot of other people who get involved in student politics, I was a school captain of my high school. So I feel like it was a really um, interesting way to express my interest in student leadership and student advocacy. And I had some experience within the USU because I had been involved in clubs and I'd been involved in reviews and I'd worked for the USU. And I just saw the influence that it had and a lot of power it had on campus. And I had a vision for what I wanted it to look like. Um, and so it was all about having people around me who also really believed that I could create important change in the USU um, and having that confidence in myself that I felt that I could really lead this enormous, enormous organization. So I guess that's kind of the motivation behind it. Okay, so you're obviously very involved on activities on campus. Have you taken up any other student leadership roles in the university? Yeah, so I've been here for many years. So I've, I've collected a lot of different things. So I was on the faculty board, the arts, um, the FAST faculty board. So you sit with the dean and the heads of different schools and you talk about really important um, Bachelor of Arts related issues because I do a double degree of arts and law. I was also a student representative councillor. So that was a different election that I had to run in. Um, and I got elected to the council and then to the general executive. So I helped with the behind the scenes of the SRC and we voted on motions. I was the executive on the French, the Italian and the writing societies, even though I don't speak those languages, I just had a passion. And I was a women's, um, I was on the women's committee for the law society. I was the assistant director of the law review twice. Um, I've done a lot of volunteer work. So I um, tutored refugees during lockdown. Um, and I also, did um, a kind of a uh, outreach thing for um, any students from low SCS areas and making sure they feel supported on campus. I was a student ambassador for a bit, so I, I ran a lot of like the info day stuff like this, but on the ground. I um, also was the environmental officer for the SRC and the USU, and so I was involved a lot with climate activism. So you probably remember the bushfires and those big rallies, so I was involved in a lot of that. We did a lot of, did a lot of speaking events around that. Um, and also focus a lot on the university sustainability strategy. And I just had like various jobs on campus, like the USU student activities officer. So I was running a lot of the festivals and stuff. Um, and I also briefly mentored DL scholars, um, 
the law students, the art students, and I also write. I'm a journalist for Onisoir and Pulp, which is the USC's online media. I have no idea how you juggle all of those. That, that sounds like all those activities you've done. Um, now we're going to go to Slider for our last question for you. As the president of the USU, what does your role usually look like day to day? Gosh, that's a great question. I go to a lot of university meetings. So I do, I work really closely with the university student life committee. I also have regular meetings with the rest of the board because there's about five students who are elected onto uh, the board each year. So there's about 13 of us. So meeting with them, meeting with the university, talking to all our different programs and departments. Um, I'm thinking of initiatives. So I'm talking to the other student organizations like the SRC, the SUSF. Um, I'm contacting, you know, unions across the world. Um, I'm doing a lot of conversing with different people and planning and strategizing. So that's kind of my job. That's all we have time for today, Prudence. It was all my pleasure to speak to you today and thank you so much for having you on. Next up, we're going to get to see some panels that were recorded earlier in the week. First, we'll talk to some students about their exchange experiences and then we'll chat to students who are living on campus with student accommodation. So we'll be right back. Welcome to Sydney University's Elite Athlete Program. You'll have a range of services and benefits available for you whilst on scholarship with us. The TAG High Performance Gym is built for our athletes. You can access the club during your allocated session times or by requesting a session with the SUSF Strength and Conditioning Coach. Athletes must be supervised in the gym by one of the SUSF Physical Preparation staff. The facilities here also include ice baths and medical treatment rooms, which are often used by teams on game days. Athletes also have access to Arena Gym's cardio and weights facilities. EAP athletes have access to the SUSAC pool, but don't have access to the SUSAC gym. Sport-specific facilities, such as the boxing gym and group fitness classes, may be available as needed. Athletes just need to discuss this with their EAP coordinator. Coordinators are located in the Arena Sports Centre. Athletes can pop in at any time to ask for any questions, advice or just to touch base. EAP athletes also have access to a space for study at Arena Sports Centre. It's located upstairs next to the ledge. Athletes can book the room by contacting Arena Sports Centre reception. Athletes have access to complimentary tutoring. Whether you're struggling with your studies or trying to increase your average, tutoring can be requested through their SmarterBase account. Other services such as performance psychology, sports nutrition and individual strength and conditioning services can be requested as needed. Academic advice and advocacy is available to all EAP members. Your coordinator is there to assist in subject degree selection as well as balancing your study with your sporting commitments. This may mean getting extensions for your assignments or moving assessments around as needed. Hopefully this assistance will help you achieve your sporting and academic goals. The benefits of studying online are probably the convenience. So you're able to watch everything when you get the chance to and you're more flexible. The biggest benefit for me is not having to commute to university for my early 8.30 lectures. I really enjoy the online courses, especially the workshop. And we have a lot of chance to share our ideas with other students. The opportunity to take a bit more time out for myself. I've been able to learn more and enjoy more hobbies that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to do. Studying online has also allowed me to spend more time with my pets and also my family, which I've really appreciated. Staying in contact is pretty good. I've been using Slack. I've been using uh, Canvas a little bit and Edstep. I think the main app everyone's been using is Zoom because it's quite easy to use, it's quite accessible. Our new group has a Facebook page which has allowed us to keep in contact with each other and also share memes while we study online. The course coordinators have actually done a really good job of keeping true to the experiential intentions of the program and we've achieved this through lots and lots of Zoom case studies and simulations. If you are considering your online courses, it will be a better choice 
an in current situation because you don't need to suspend your courses and you can experience different kinds of study methods. Starting out with online study, I think it's really important to create a dedicated study space. See cluttered space, preferably away from the bedroom, will help you to balance out focus time from break time. If you just look at the positive side and understand that we are continuing with our degree, we're able to still get all of our studies and our qualifications. The only difference is that it's just online. The university and the faculty have been really amazing at ensuring that you're always supported and you don't feel like you're studying alone. So just do it. I think the potential opportunity costs outweighs the negatives of going online. The staff have all done an amazing job of transitioning the content. Okay, so thank you for joining us here on UCID TV. Um, what we're doing now is the exchange panel, which seems like a bit of a weird theme uh, as all of Sydney's in lockdown and we're all in lockdown. So we like to think about those times when we can kind of go somewhere else, whether it is virtually or in person. So today I have with me Dasha, who is one of our commerce and law students. I've got Eva, who's doing her Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Advanced Studies. And I've got Abhishek, who has completed his Bachelor of Science and is now studying his Doctor of Medicine. Thanks so much for joining me, team. Um, we'll start off um, with Dasha. So Dasha, what was your global experience? Well, I studied in Lyon in 2019 and I went for an entire semester. Um, I studied under my Bachelor of Commerce degree, majoring in finance, but alongside that, I also got to do things like um, European Union business and law and some French language and culture studies. Um, and that was quite surprising to me because it's something that I can't really do back home. So I think that's one of the highlights of the trip, being able to kind of dabble into other areas of study as well. Yeah, amazing. And what was kind of the thing that stands out the most for you from that experience? Um, I think having people from all different countries come together in one location as exchange students is something really unique and special. I still keep in touch with a lot of the friends that I made on exchange and I would consider them lifelong friends. So I think that's one of the most um, unique aspects of exchange and something that really stood out to me. Amazing. All right, next up is Abhishek. So Abhishek, what was your uh, global experience? So I, um, I did a semester long exchange as well in my second year of my Bachelor of Science degree in 2016 at the University College of London. Um, and I did biochemistry courses there as part of my science degree. Very cool. And so what was the most memorable, memorable part of studying in London? Uh, it was just, I, I think the most memorable part was the fact that being in Europe itself or being in London was sort of a gateway to allow to uh, myself to travel around the whole continent. Basically, uh, what I would do is I'd spend the week in my classes and on the weekend, I would sort of travel, take a plane across Europe to somewhere like Spain or, or Prague um, and then come back on Monday to, to go back to class. That's awesome. Did you take one of those like really cheap like Ryanair flights or something like that? Yeah, I remember yeah. one of one of uh, the cheapest flights I had was nine pounds to uh, to Edinburgh, I think. So that That's was amazing. That was fantastic. Yeah. That's just crazy. I, I can't even I don't know how they do that. Um, mm -hmm. So next up is Eva. Now, Eva, you had a bit of an unusual experience. You actually did a virtual exchange. Tell us about that. Yeah, so my um, unit was called Experience the Arab World, which is an open learning environment unit. Um, it was about two weeks long. I did it during the winter break this year. And I actually was very surprised with it because I did want to have the end country experience and I did want to travel a lot, um, but I did get to meet people. I actually am keeping in contact with some people from Jordan in Amman. And I really just loved the unit. We learned about the culture, the Arabic culture, and I actually did get a chance to make some food as well. So awesome, what did you, what did you make? Well, I made something called um, Um Ali. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, it's an uh, Arabic dessert. Um, I think it originates from Egypt. And I also made some um, hummus. It's also very exciting because I've never made hummus before. <laughs> That's amazing. 
So what was kind of challenging about doing the virtual exchange? Um, I can't say I came up upon any challenges because it was really straightforward. Um, we were given the unit outline and the schedule and it was only for two weeks. Um, I say the only thing that was challenging was that we were sitting on the computer for about three or four hours a day with not many breaks in between. But honestly, because it is such a different experience and so interesting, it just keeps you immersed until the day finishes and you're like, oh, wow, I just sat four hours on the computer. <laughs> but um, it, it was absolutely amazing. And the fact that it was actually um, free because there were no fees and I didn't have to find accommodation, no booking flights or anything. So it was all very easy going. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a silver lining in the whole uh, virtual exchange for sure. And Abhishek, what were some of the challenges that you overcame in your exchange? Um, I think the one of the main challenges was obviously being away from home for so long, uh, flying uh, across the across the world basically uh, away from your family can be a bit tricky, especially as a university student who's stayed at like who's living at home uh, at the time. Um, and so it was it was tricky, sort of getting accustomed to living in a dorm room by yourself, um, sort of taking care of yourself, but also doing uh, logistical things like being able to book flights and book accommodation and manage manage your money basically but um, I think all of those are really important skills that I learned while I was in exchange um, and it's it's made me more more comfortable with traveling by myself as well yeah absolutely it's kind of like a trial run as an independent adult but yeah exactly right yeah. environment <laughs> Um, so my next question is, what skills have you gained from your global experience? I might throw this one to Dasha. I think, well, for, for starters, I went with zero French to France. So I did pick up a little bit of French along the way. I did French language classes, very beginner classes, um, four hours a week, which is really cool to be able to do during university. But in addition to that, I also gained more of those like life skills as Abhishek was kind of touched home um, really the first time that I've had to live independently and in, you know things like doing my own groceries and laundry um, I mean you know you can do those things at home as well but it's just completely different when it's in a different language with different culture living with I was living in, a do um, in an apartment with four other people from completely different areas of the world so that was just um, such a unique experience and it kind of forces you to um, learn about yourself and learn about others and it was just a really um, it's, it's a really condensed period of self-development so I think that's just uh, totally invaluable and it can't really be replicated back at home so that was probably um, the the thing that I took away from exchange. Yeah that's great. awesome. Um, Eva what about you what what skills do you think you've gained from your experience? Well, I've definitely learned some Arabic, although we didn't do the actual Arabic alphabet in our classes. We did the Latin version. Um, I did pick up some phrases. I got to practice it in our language classes, even though you think if I don't go to the country, I'm not even going to practice the language. But you really do because they construct the lessons in a way that you take away a few things. So it's, it's important to do it virtually as well, not just going in the country. Um, I did learn so Arabic and I gained some cooking skills because I didn't have many <laughs> so <laughs> definitely learned some skills there and I actually got a better understanding of some of the current issues that exist in the Arabic countries and why they still exist so we learned that through the course yeah that's super interesting so Eva you've already mentioned that you actually didn't pay for your experience and so you know it was a virtual one um, but Abhishek and Dasha a lot of students are concerned about paying for their overseas experiences how did you guys you know fund this? You want to take um, it, yeah sure um, so I was in my second year of, of my undergrad degree so not too far from high school I was working at the time, so I, I had saved a little bit of money and I was fortunate enough to have a scholarship from the University of Sydney already. So that really helped. Uh, besides that, there are a couple of extra avenues for exchange that I, um, that I sort of took up uh, on to myself as well, which really helped. One of them was the Global Mobility Scholarship that um, UCID offers. So at the time for me, it was $1,000, but I, I believe currently with the... Um, the, the DL Scholars Program as well. It's $2,000. So that, that would go a long way to um, helping fund uh, an exchange program. And that, that could be helping with a semester-long program or even a short-term program as well. 
Uh, besides that, as a um, as an extra little boost of, of of funding, I applied for an OS help loan from the government, uh, which was a um, a hex funded scholarship where um, I sort of it was sort of like a loan basically. So it's added onto my um, hex fees, but that really went a long way to help with my um, my exchange funding as well. Yes. Yeah. So those OS loans, they're, they're like your hex loans in which you don't have to pay them back really quickly and they don't accrue interest. Um, yeah. They just go up with the consumer price each year and you only have to start paying them back after you're earning a certain amount, which is, you know, pretty, yeah. pretty great. Uh, Dasha, how did you fund your experience? I'm in a pretty similar boat, actually. I was actually in my third year already, so I actually decided to put away all of the income that I'd made um, for a certain amount of time specifically for exchange because I knew I was going away but in addition to that I really didn't think that I would be able to fund um, exchange when I was in high school I just thought that's you know never going to happen it's so expensive to go overseas um, I never really even thought that it would be an option but I remember um, when I applied for exchange they automatically consider you for a, a couple of scholarships so there are the global mobility scholarships but then also one day I got an email just from the business faculty saying um, here's another scholarship um, for uh, your exchange. It, it was $2,000, which was so, so good to just wake up and see that money, you know, um, into the bank account for my exchange kind of fund. Um, and also there are other scholarships that you can apply for that I personally didn't, but I was looking into them that um, certain countries that you might want to travel to, they actually offer scholarships. For example, if you want to work at the same time in the country, they can also offer you things like bursaries and um, help with fees. So um, there are heaps of options and I definitely shouldn't have been so stressed about funding it because the, the university was more than willing to help in that respect. Oh, that's awesome. And everybody loves a bit of free money to help go travel and uh, study overseas and all that sort of thing. Um, okay, so we're gonna have to wrap it up, guys. Um, but before we do, I'm just gonna ask one final question. Uh, what would you say to someone um, who was considering whether or not to take part in a global experience? Dasha, I'll start with you. Um, well, I would have one to like one thing to say. It's just, you know, just do it, plan ahead. Um, if you really want to do it, there are ways to make it happen. And the university is more than willing to help. And um, you just learn so much about yourself and others and other cultures that um, you really won't be able to get um, back home. So honestly, just go for it, say yes, and, you know, see the opportunity. Thanks for that one. Uh, and Emma, what about you? Well, pretty much the same, but I am going to say that it's an amazing and eye-opening experience that whether you choose to do it virtually or face-to-face, -face, you will gain substantial knowledge and, um, about other cultures. And I think it's really important and it's relevant for any discipline. So if you're able to do it, um, you should definitely do it. There's funding, there's help from the university and from the government. So definitely do it. It's an amazing experience. Wonderful, thank you. Abhishek, are you, are you back? You're at the hospital at yep. the moment, aren't you? So yes, sorry, it's a little bit, no, little bit busy good. at the moment, yeah. No, the question was, if somebody was considering to take part in exchange or, or not, what would you be your advice to them? Um, I'd say go for it. Um, it's probably one of the best experiences I've had in my university career. Um, there are many options in terms of funding for it from the university and from the government. And... Uh, it's always a fantastic opportunity to not only be able to study in another country and, and learn about how they have, like how they like, organize their universities, but also a fantastic opportunity to travel and, um, and learn sort of about a new culture and a new way of life. That's great. Thank well, thank you all so much for joining me and thank you to everybody who's joined our exchange panel. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your open day and the rest of UCID TV and we'll see you around. Okay, bye. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us on UCID TV. We are now going to go through our accommodation panel. So there's a few different options for accommodation at the University of Sydney. So we have a couple of college students and a couple of resident students. First up, we have Victoria, who is originally from the northern beaches of Sydney, and she's at the Women's College. Next up, we have Nadine, all the way from Germany, uh, who is at the regiment building. 
Then we have Kieran, who's from Mosman, which is in Sydney. Uh, he's at St. Andrews College and just proves that you don't actually have to live that far away to want to live on campus. And then finally, we have Pat, who is part of the Bears on Darlington Road. So first question for you, Victoria, what is the best part about living at your college? Um, living at women's, I love the community aspect. Um, being able to socialize with your friends so easily, having breakfast, lunch and dinner with them, and then also having the opportunity to study alongside them as well. It's just a really nice feeling and having your friends there who are going through the same thing to support you is really fun as well. Yeah, that's lovely. And Nadine at the regiment, what is the best part about living there? Um, obviously the community as well, but also um, meeting people from all over the world. Regimen is quite known for having a lot of exchange students. Obviously with COVID that wasn't possible, but um, as, soon as, as soon as the borders open up, I think they will come back. And just, yeah, meeting people from all over the, all over the world and just, um, yeah, sharing our culture with them. It's amazing. That's great. And Kieran, at St. Andrews, what's, your, what's the be best part of living there? Well, I echo everything that everyone else has said about the community aspect, but I also, I think that there's a lot of other benefits. Um, you have sporting benefits. Um, I personally have a lot of music benefits. I get to perform in a choir every week. Um, I get to work with great musicians, um, weekly tutoring, um, just a lot of things that are very difficult to organise after high school. So having those um, so close to campus is just great. Amazing. And Patrick, what do you like about the Bears? Uh, yeah, well, unlike the other accommodations available at the uni, the Bears, also known as the Darlington Terraces or Darlington House, is more of an, like, an apartment style of independent living, but it's also supported by the residential life team and other staff. That's great. So it sounds like everybody gets a lot of programs, a lot of support. And um, so my question then would be, what is your favourite program on offer, Victoria? This is a hard one because we have so many great opportunities. Um, I think the academic program um, gives you extra tutorials for your university subjects. So um, it pairs you with other students in your um, subject and that way you can help study with each other and then we also have the leadership program so really developing our leadership skills through workshops um, we have team weeks where we just focus on training so that we can help the younger girls coming through college um, to support their journey through university and then also welcome them into college yeah so lots to choose from and Nadine what is your favorite program on offer at Regiment? Um, we have quite a large variety of events, so, um, but my favourites are probably, we have weekly sporting events, such as like boxing or yoga, um, and then during Stuvac, we have um, a petting zoo sometimes come in, um, where we get to pet uh, a bunch of little chickens or uh, goats, so that one is definitely my favourite, because um, yeah, it just helps you relax so much, and um, we have a bu bunch of other events that focus on, focus on our mental health, and where our A's check up on us and make sure, um, yeah, everything's going great. Yeah, it sounds lovely. And Kieran at St. Andrews, what's your favourite program? Well, I think, um, as Victoria was saying, at the colleges, there's just so many programs. But, I mean, I'd say, I, I, I'd agree the academic program's fabulous. Um, I might have to throw in a little little plug here. Um, I, I love the uh, the Drew's News program, which is the student blog. I, I am the editor of it, but I think that's a really great program in the sense that it gives a lot of people an opportunity to tell their stories and to, to share their experiences in a different way and also just helps with their writing and general skills development. So I think the college really does put on a lot of programs that really help with skills development and academic development in, in a fun and exciting way. That's great. Drew's News, I love that name. And Pat, what about you at the Bears? What, what's your favourite program? Well, yeah, at the Bears, just like every other accommodation, we offer a variety of events from sports, academics, uh, arts and anything. Uh, but probably my favourite is probably we run, well, we don't run, we're involved in the intramural sports competition where it's like a little competition between all the residents um, at the uni 
and we just get to verse each other in different sports every once in a while. So I don't know, I do enjoy that bit of competition. Yeah, is that your is that your jersey as well that you're wearing? Uh, yeah, this is one of our uniforms. We do have other uniforms as well for the Bears that look pretty similar to this. So yeah. Very cool. Okay, next question is, what event has been the most memorable at your college or residence? Victoria. Um, again, I have a few. I love supporting my friends um, and also competing in the intercollegiate competition. So women's will verse Kieran's College St. Andrews um, in things, all sports and then dance and things. I was involved in the Palladian dance team last year. Um, and then I also love the social events. So women's has some great formals, which are fun to just dress up and be with your friends and some other colleges as well. You're allowed to invite other people. So a lot of the time they are from other colleges. So it's that community feeling of all being together, which I love. It's lovely. And Nadine, most memorable event? Um, I think for regiment, it would be definitely our yearly cruises that we used to share with Queen Mary and um, I think even Dalo Bears. Um, so yeah, they've been always amazing. Um, everyone just goes crazy and we have a really good time. Everyone dresses up as well. Same as um, our yearly ball. Um, and yeah, just the intramural sports and arts competitions are amazing. Um, yeah, a, a couple of months ago, we had like quite a few people competing in like singing or dancing. Um, it was just really good and very memorable. Yeah, excellent. Kieran, most memorable event? Well, I think there are so many, but um, I think the formals are obviously great because, I mean, once you leave high school, there generally aren't too many opportunities to dress up and just have a great time, but um, the college formals are always good fun. Um, and then there's always sort of a, a couple of official events every year, which are also great fun. This year we opened up the new building and... Um, and we were lucky to have the governor general there. Um, and we've had plenty of events like that, which are always very fun. There's always a lot of music, a lot of um, a lot of very nice food and a lot of just exciting moments. Yeah, amazing. Sounds really good. And Pat, most memorable event. Yeah, I'd have to say my most memorable event was one of our first events at the start of this year when we came out of the COVID pandemic. And we just had a really big barbecue in our backyards that we have at the terraces. And we pretty much just invited everyone that lives here over and we just cooked up hundreds of sausages and just had a very good night. Oh, that sounds so good. I can't wait to do that sort of thing again. Okay, final question for everybody. Now, you've all been living in uh, either residences or colleges for quite a number of years. So I'm very clear to me that you enjoy it. Um, but if you could choose one thing, what's the best thing about living so close to campus? Victoria. For me, it's being able to walk to class so quickly when we're in person um, and saying hi to your friends along the way. There's not, I don't think, been one time where I haven't seen someone that I know. So just that community feeling, even going to class um, and yeah, just being able to get there in 10 minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds great. Nadine. Um, I think regiment, um, yeah, out of all accommodation is almost uh, the closest to campus because we live right on City Road. And um, yeah, it's, it's amazing like waking up and we just always, usually always walk together to class. Um, but also even if you maybe oversleep, you're in there, uh, you're there at class in like five minutes. So um, you can really like get out of bed at the latest possible time. <laughs> Um, which is sometimes really good. Yeah, I could see how that could be an, an advantage. And uh, Kieran, best thing about living so close to campus? Just having that ability to have that community feeling and that community spirit, I think is something that is really great about college, especially at this time. Yeah. And lucky last, Pat, what is the best thing about living so close to campus? Well, just to add on what everyone else has said, um, my favourite thing is just being at uni and then if I have a break I can just come home with my friends bring my friends over for lunch and I don't need to like pack my lunch take it to uni or anything I can just five minutes back home and then back to class again so yeah sounds like a dream sounds awesome okay well that's all the time we have for our accommodation panel today thank you so much for joining me panelists 
and I'll now throw you back to the rest of UCID TV. Oh, welcome back everyone. So unfortunately we have now come to the end of Open Day and UCID TV. It's been an absolute pleasure having you all tuning in from home. A few reminders before we leave you for the day. You can still book in sessions to chat with our students or attend webinars online for the rest of the year, which is really cool. Um, you can find this information on our website in the section dedicated to prospective student events, but you can also come back to what come back to the Open Day website after we have finished broadcasting and continue watching UCID TV as the stream has been recorded so that you can rewatch your favorite moments including mine. Um, feel free to share it with any of your friends that might have missed us live too on Tarati for the last time. So we understand that there have been a few recent changes with the HSC and offer rounds because of COVID. And I just want to reiterate, if you have any questions, we do have an FAQ on our admissions pathway on our admissions pathway website to say, or you can speak to our staff in the admissions hub. So please, we want you guys not to stress. Don't worry. We'll advise you guys of any changes as they come. So we really enjoyed being your host today at UC TV. And we just want to thank the whole team at Student Recruitment and Indigenous Strategy and Service Media team behind the scenes who have worked tirelessly in putting this open day and UC TV on for everyone. We really hope that you all enjoyed it. Thank you so much for being a part of it. And we hope you had a great day and we hope to see you soon on campus. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye.